Okay, now we're in open session. Welcome. <clears throat> Did you hear that, Jose? Okay, good. Okay, so this is open session. This is a special recognition. Wait for everybody, thank you so much. Um, this is where we do special recognitions and I'd like to uh, invite up Mrs. Lash. Oh. <laughs> Is that a baby? Is that for real? Hello? Ooh, that was right on cue, baby. In November, we lost an integral part of our TVUSD family far too soon. And so tonight, is it, it's with mixed emotions that we are honoring the incredible So tonight, it's with mixed emotions that we are honoring the incredible human being that is Mr. John Miller. I'd like to turn it over now to our Executive Director of Maintenance, Operations, and Transportation, Mr. Jason Osborne. Dr. Komorowski, members of the board, Dr. McClay, members of cabinet, it is my honor to be here tonight to pay tribute to our colleague and our friend, John Miller. John worked for the, Temecula, for the Temecula Valley Unified School District for nearly 30 years. He started in 1993 and promoted his way through the maintenance department to being the leader of that department as its coordinator for the last five years. <laughs> Sorry. Um, his leadership has been incredible in this, in this capacity. He knew the district like the back of his hand. He would often comment as we were looking at something that needed to be fixed. I remember when, insert the name of any retiree, built that, and I built that. Or it happened often that the crew would be out looking for a leak and John would pull up and say, don't look there, it's over here. He knew how it needed to be repaired and he knew how to do it. John's decisions were always made with the lens of what would be best for the students we serve. He had a strong dedication to public education and wanted everything to be working and ready for the students and staff. A trait I think he came by pretty naturally as he often talked about his mother and his sister who were educators in the, who were educators in the Corona and Riverside school districts respectively. His contributions can not only be seen in the Temecula Valley Unified Schools, but more importantly in the people who maintain them. The Monday following John's passing, we had the crew together as we looked around, as I looked around the room, I could instantly see the impact that John had. Most of the crew had either been hired or promoted by John. He had an incredible eye for people's talents and how to help them be successful. John was a friend to everyone. He might have been a, he might have been a stranger when you met, but you never left a stranger. He took the time to get to know you and made you feel like talking to you was the most important thing he had to do that day. I'm pretty sure if you walked around through the and talked uh, through the district, the office staff and administrators would know John by name and have some story about their interaction or some way John had been a help to them. I greatly enjoyed the conversations I had with John. Uh, we talked often and while, while he worked hard, he knew that, th that the most important thing to him was his family. He would often talk about listening to his son Johnny play music or Danielle and her husband's new trailer where they could go camping with them. But most often, it was about where he and Donna were going to go camping and, and the fun that they would have, meeting friends and finding new adventures. Sean was a simple guy. He loved the beauty of, place, of the places he camped. He kept photos of Zion's Canyon in his office and talked about adventures in the Barago Desert. Most of all, he loved the people that were around him and was always happy when the kids joined them. John will be missed, but not gone. His impact is evidenced in those around us John's influence made others better. I, for one, cherish the influence he had on me as a colleague, but more importantly, as a friend. It's our pleasure tonight to have John's family with us. His wife, Donna Miller, is here. His, her, his daughter, Danielle Cornwell, and her husband, Tommy. Johnny Miller, his son. Doris Osco, his mother. And Susan Bain, his sister. And with that, there's a few things we'd like to um, 
honor John's memory with and in with his family. We've got a certificate of recognition and appreciation for the family. Um, this year marked 30 years with TVUSD, and so we have a 30-year service coin to give you as well. And then lastly, um, we give out bells uh, as we ring in someone's retirement, and we'd like to honor you with a bell as uh, we ring in honor of Mr. Miller. The last thing that we have made um, is this beautiful plaque that we're going to hang in our maintenance and operations department that will hang there um, for all of us to honor and remember our friend. So, thank you. Next up for recognitions this evening, we invite Mrs. Janet Dixon to the podium. If Jessica and Patricia are here, you can come up. Come on up. <laughs> okay. The Measure Y uh, Citizens Oversight Committee is a Brown Act committee, and it's required by Proposition 39, and it reviews the progress of our general obligation bond projects and reviews the annual audits of Measure Y. There are seven committee members representing five specific roles plus two at-large members. Members serve the two-year terms and can serve up to three consecutive terms. Later tonight, you'll be voting on the replacements for these retiring board members. And uh, right now, we're recognizing our outgoing COC members and thanking them for their service. So we have Patricia Ramirez. And Patricia has served on the COC for two terms, total of four years. She started out as one of our parent representatives, but then when her youngest graduated from the, the uh, district, she became uh, one of our at-large members, and uh, we thank her for her service. So thank you, Patricia. <laughs> and Jessica was supposed to be here today, but she served on the COC for five years, and um, we are losing her from the COC because she got a job with the district. So while we're sorry to see her go from the COC, she's not going far, and we're happy to have her do that. And then Jonathan, Jonathan Greedberg um, served on the COC for the entire three terms, so a total of six years. Jonathan uh, served as a retired, he was a retired uh, superintendent for the Paris High School District. So uh, he teases me that I was a little nervous when he joined the, the uh, committee, but he asked great questions and was a wonderful member for the entire six years. So uh, we appreciate their service. Thank you. And next we invite up Mr. Tim LaCour from Chaparral High School. He has some special awards to give to the CIF Southern Section Division II Dual Meet Title Wrestling Team Champions. That's a mouthful. Thank you. That was a mouthful. Um, I'm here, um, Tim LaCour, Athletic Director from Chaparral High School. Uh, my job is to hire coaches, and sometimes we are lucky enough to have incredible coaches that impact the lives of student athletes. We look for coaches that impact those student lives because those transform cultures. And when cultures transform, we begin to see winning. And when we win enough and we have the right recipe of student athletes, coaches and culture, we win CIF, right? We have, and we're here to honor a dual champions, uh, Division II dual champions. Uh, so congratulations, uh, Max Irvin, if I can have you come up. Yeah, 
this work and right. hey thank you everybody i really appreciate it thank you for having us uh this is a big deal for the program this is the first cif title in uh chaparral wrestling history and only the third for the school overall so it's a really big uh, honor for us the kids did an awesome job my coaching staff did a great job we're just really lucky with the people we had around us this year everything really came into place and i just could not be more thankful for just what all the kids did for this uh, throughout their four years and this year and for what my coaching staff and all the parents have done recently. Uh, it's just been an awesome, awesome four years that I've been the head coach and I can't wait for the future. So uh, I'm gonna read off these names of my coaching staff and all these awesome kids and wrestlers that really made all this come together. So first up is our JV coach, Mr. Mike Sarmiento. Our freshman coach, Mr. Ryan Basnay. We've got Mr. Ethan Alvarez, 170-pounder. Oh, 152-pounder, okay. <laughs> Tyler Augenbaugh. 106 pounder and freshman on the varsity squad, Benjamin Banania. <laughs> 113 pounder and freshman, Hunter Basnay. Uh, we have Declan Bowman. Declan's unfortunately not here tonight, but he did a great job this year. We've got the big man, heavyweight Josh Byers. One hundred and thirty two pounder senior Gabe Canella. One hundred thirty eight pounder senior Damian Diaz. One hundred and ninety five pounder senior Dylan Ellingworth. One hundred and six pounder freshman Michael Gelati. 120-pounder, Carson Gonzalez. 126-pounder, senior and team captain, Justin Herrera. 126-pounder, Paul Hymas. 160-pounder, Travion Jones. 120 pounder, senior team captain, Onello Lorberter. 113 pounder, senior Eric Miramontes. 182 pounder, freshman Dylan Natselli. 160 pounder and team captain, Ivan Natselli. 220 pounder Vaughn Taylor, senior. 170 pounder senior Jonathan Vargas. And last but certainly not least, senior and team captain, 145 pounder Mr. Milo Zamudio. Thank you guys very much. I really appreciate it. Congratulations, Pumas. Next up, we have Mr. John Harney the, from the Golden Bears. Yeah. 
Mr. Harney is going to recognize the CIF Southern Section Division I individual champions. Good evening, Dr. McClay, Assistant Superintendents and the Governing Board. Uh, thank you for having us back here again tonight to highlight the achievements of TVHS Athletics. Our Golden Bears continue to hold themselves up uh, to the Go Bears values of brave, engaged, aware, resilient, and service-minded. We are proud to spotlight their work and their representation in our community and beyond. We are honored to recognize our individual CIF championship wrestling team. Their achievements this year are many. In 2023, they were the Southwestern League championship, uh, champions for the 35th consecutive year. With eight all-league selections and two all-league MVPs in Aiden Munoz and Matthew Porras Diamond. They were 2023 CIF Southern Section Division I dual team semifinalists. They were the 2023 CIF individual Southern Division team champions with four CIF champions, Aiden Munoz, Malachi Espiritu, Cameron Phillips, and Matthew Porras Diamond. They were the two th in 2023, they had a section master's championship with Malachi Espiritu. They had six 2023 Southern Section Masters placers, seven state qualifiers, with Aiden Munoz in the top 12 and Matthew Porras Diamond in the top 16. We would also like to thank and recognize their coaches, Mario and Marco DeCaro, who are former Golden Bear wrestlers, uh, and Veronica Cubas as a, uh, with coach, and Hall of Fame coach uh, Lyndon Campbell, who have been part of leading this program for the last 26 plus years and helped create this championship culture. I'm gonna hand it over to Coach Campbell right now, who's gonna honor the individual athletes. Uh, superintendent, you know, assistant superintendents, governing board, appreciate you guys for uh, having this opportunity. Lene, shout out to you. All right, taking care of Jody McClay there. All right, I want to thank everybody that did show up here tonight to honor their kids and be here and be a part of that because that's so important. Yeah, I've been here for 28 years. You know, uh, Mr. Miller, I've worked side by side. You know, that broke my heart. He's a family friend. My father, my father-in-law, Anthony Berger, uh, was a family friend, and that's how I'm tied into this district. All right, through them. And, you know, I've been here for 28 years, and I'm sorry for your loss, you know, but uh, he was an awesome man, and I wanted to tell you that before I left this room tonight. All right. Um, with that being said, yeah, I want to honor these men that, that wrestled. No, the best thing about this year was nobody gave us a chance. You know, my good buddy retired, and uh, they all thought I retired. And, uh, but I was looking to, for somebody to take over our program. That's why we dug deep down inside for the DeCaro brothers. I mean, Mario wrestled for me, Marco wrestled for us, and they know what we expect. And so they came, and I want to thank those coaches. I mean, Miss Cuba, she does all of our paperwork. You know how much it takes to do all that paperwork. There she is. She started off as our paperwork coach and has developed into so many different things for us. But more importantly, it's not about the coaches. It's about these kids that show up. They're the new set that comes in. They're the new set that comes out. Yes, he read a bunch of accomplishments. Yes, it's a new year. Uh, sometimes it never gets old. I'm going to tell you that, okay? And that's why these kids work that hard. So please hold your applause. Let me get them all up here, and then you can give them a, well, a big well, go Bears, or welcome, or however you want to do it, all right? So we're going to start off with our littlest guy and work our way to our biggest dude, all right? So at 106 pounds, we got Isaiah Trujillo. Come on up, all right? Hey, 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 hey. I said hold your applause, all right? Okay, 113 pounds. We have uh, Travis Reedy. Come on up. 120, Aiden Munoz, yeah, this guy right here, captain, grew up in our program, was our Golden Bear ambassador this year. Okay, 126, that's all right. That's why I made your job harder a little bit. All right, 126, I'm not going in alphabet, I'm going by weight order, because that's the Bible in wrestling. All right, by weight. 126, you don't look like 126 anymore. Okay, Gabriel Lemos, all right, this is uh, Coach Cubis's grandson. All right, so his uh, uncle wrestled in our program before him, and that's why he's in our program now, right? 132, we got Malachi Espritu, all right? It was one of the Masters champions you were talking about. 138, we got Marvin Morton right here. Um, don't, don't worry about his dad, who's the principal at TMS, all right? 
Marvin has come a long way. We love him for what he's done. He actually helped us win a CIF championship this year uh, when he stepped up. So I want to give him props to that. 145, we have Ashton Lassig. Um, uh, he's not here, but we're going to 152s. Uh, we got Daniel the Professor Sterling here. All right, senior. 160s, we got Logan Awane. 170s, Cameron Phillips. 182, Mr. Gabriel Banks. 195, Matthew Pores Diamond. 220, Chase Bergeson. And our heavyweight, which only weighed about 205 at the time, uh, Justice El Sayad. And the heavyweight weight class goes up to 285 pounds. All right? And the last thing I'm going to tell you is I'm so proud of these guys. Not only on the, I mean, you can take academics, that's the most important. Okay, athletic accomplishments are amazing, but it's not the end of the world, okay? We produce taxpaying citizens, that's what we do, okay? And that's what I tell them, that's the biggest joke, because when I retire, somebody's gotta take over, right? And it's hopefully these wrestlers that put in a lot of dedication and time and effort. Just like Chaparral, that was an amazing accomplishment this year for them to go to Division II and win a championship and represent our community. That was just as important as our individual championship, okay? Because when they're winning, that means we're making wrestling better in this community, okay? And that's how I see it. But the reason I'm so proud of this group of kids is because my father passed away during this, okay? During that day. They allowed me that night to take home the trophy, drove back to where my dad was in Nevada and give him the trophy and tell him one last time on Saturday night after the tournament was over at five o'clock. Vegas, an hour delay, life flight and somebody else had a miserable time. Getting there to my dad, telling him, this is what we got dad and him shaking his head of approval. One last championship that I was able to bless my dad with and not so much, but these kids and that staff was the people that made it happen. And the next day on Sunday, he passed away. So yeah, this championship will forever be in my heart. So thank you for allowing me to come tell my story tonight. Hopefully I didn't take up too much time. But yeah, building taxpayer citizens is what it's about. Thank you very much. <laughs> Awesome job, Bears. For our last recognition this evening, we invite Mr. John Harney back to the podium to honor two of our amazing coaches. Nice job, guys. I'm also pleased to honor tonight the TVHS girls soccer program and their coaches. TVHS soccer coaches Jennifer Gwynn and her longtime assistant Laura Witz were recognized this past January in Philadelphia for receiving the 2022 United Soccer Coaches Award for California State Coach of the Year for large public schools. California's a big state, that's quite an accomplishment. In this year of this award, they won their fifth straight Southwestern League title a CIF Division I title and a CIF State Regional title, ending the season with a 21-game win streak. The Golden Bears continued their winning ways this year after being undefeated in the league and winning their sixth straight Southwestern League title. Under their leadership of Coach Gwynn and Coach Witz, eight athletes will be bringing their soccer skills to the collegiate level next year. And in addition to their leadership on the field, they have, uh, uh, have skilled students in the classroom with a team average GPA of 4.04. .04. So it is with this recognition, I'd like to bring up Ms. Gwynn and Ms. Witz to receive this, uh, th these certificates.
Thank you for this honor. I'm just happy that we're not sharing our weight class. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been an honor to, um, actually I have six kids and five of my girls have gone through, uh, well, if one boy and then the five girls, they all played for Temecula Valley High School. Um, so it's been an honor to be able to be part of their lives and the lives of hundreds of these girls who we, we kind of stalk and follow later and see what they're doing in life and they come back and we, our uh, alumni games are getting bigger and bigger and it's so great to see now they're coming out and they have kids and to be part of that that just goes on and on has been an absolute blessing and an honor for me to be part of and um, anyway just thank you so much for uh, recognizing this because it, it, we were two of four women in the entire country that were honored as high school coaches. So it really was, um, we're just thrilled that we were able to go and, and uh, be a part of that. So thank you so much for this recognition and um, turn it over to head coach Jennifer Gwynn. All right, yeah, thank you guys so much. Um, we were so excited to come here to this board meeting and um, you know, our, we took a trip to Philadelphia, as you know, and um, it was a real last minute decision just because it was during our season and uh, the girls were the priority. And that's just, I mean, the titles and the accolades are so incredible, but without those girls and those athletes and the parents and my coaching staff and our school support, um, you know, we would not have received any of this. And so um, we're just so extremely blessed. Uh, it's my, it'll be my 10th season next year with TV, and that is crazy, but 10 years with Laura, and I've known her for years before that, so it's been amazing to do this together and just feel so blessed to work alongside such a great human being. So um, congratulations to all the athletes in the room and our Golden Bears, and um, just proud of everyone. Thank you guys so much. Yes, administration. I love that intro. Thank you, Coach Laura. <laughs> See why I keep such great people next to me. Anyways, thank you guys so much for this. We appreciate it. So that concludes the recognitions part of the board meeting tonight. We'll take about a four to five minute break and reconvene for open session at six o'clock.
Mic check. Just want to kindly end. Hello, just wanted to kindly ask everybody if you want to exit this right door so that we can bring in the audience from the outside. Testing, 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 testing. It's really, it's starting to really come down again. Testing, testing, testing. I know, testing. I was just thinking about it. Testing, 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 testing. Test, test, test. Test, test.
Okay, we're now in open session. I'm going to call to order. All right. Yeah, is the mic on? It's good. Good evening and welcome to the regular open session meeting of the Temecula Unified School District. I'd appreciate it if everybody keep it down. Calling to order. Thank you. Thank you so much. Good evening and welcome to the regular open session meeting of the Temecula, Uni uh, Temecula Valley Unified School District Board of Education on March 14, 2023 at 6.13. The board has been in closed session since 4 p.m. We have attendance governing board, Mrs. Allison Barclay, Mr. Danny Gonzalez, Dr. Joseph Komorowski, Mr. Stephen Schwartz, Mrs. Jennifer Wiersma, Secretary to the board, Dr. Jody McClay, Superintendent, Mrs. Nicole Ash, Assistant Superintendent, Business Support Services, Ms. Kimberly Velez, soon to be Dr. Mrs. Kimberly Velez, <clears throat> Assistant Superintendent, Educational Support Services, Mr. Frank Arce, Assistant Superintendent, Human Resources Development, Ms. Nicole Deus, Assistant Superintendent, Student Support Services, and Mrs. Lene Anastabar, as, uh, executive assistant to the superintendent. And now for our special guest coming up, Zachary and Session to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Okay. Please, okay. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. Hats and caps off. Right hand over your heart. Ready, begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, for liberty and justice for all. You may be seated. You may be seated. Thank you so much. And they are from Abby Ranke Elementary. Read out of action taken in closed session. Closed session began at 4 p.m. The Board of Education took the following action in closed session. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Gonzalez to approve the notice of recommendation for immediate suspension without pay and dismissal from employment and statement of charges for classified employee number 166301, effective March 15th, 2023. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Wiersma to approve the notice of recommendation for immediate suspension without pay and dismissal from employment and statement of charges for classified employee number 196149, effective March 15th, 2023. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Gonzalez to approve the settlement offer for government entity claims against Jewel Labs, Inc. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Barclay to deny the claim for damages for PG received on February 21st, 2023. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Wiersma and seconded by Member Schwartz to deny the claim for damages for RD dated February 8th, 2023. The vote was 5-0. It was moved by Member Schwartz and seconded by Member Gonzalez to deny the claim for damages for KM received February 6th, 2023. And the vote was 5-0. Thanks, Ms. Wiersma. Then we had recognitions, announcements, school-related organizations. Before the board meeting began, the board recognized John Miller, a 20-plus year TVUSD administrator, our Citizens Oversight Committee representatives, Chaparral's first-time Division II Wrestling Championship, Temecula Valley 
Temecula Valley's Division I individual wrestling champions and our United Soccer Coach Coaches Coach and Assistant Coach of the Year. We will now have our student spotlights. We'll bring up first Summer and Avery from Chaparral High School. Hi everyone, I'm still Summer Shitty, Chaparral High School's ASB president. And I'm still Avery Page, Chaparral ASB vice president. It's good to see you all again. And sorry I couldn't make it to the last meeting. I was out sick from school at Disneyland. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Beginning on March 20 and concluding mid-April, juniors will take the California Assessment of Student Performance and Progress, CASP, which is the annual system of assessments given to students in the California public schools. Most students are very familiar with the test, bringing back memories from as far back as elementary school, and we wish everyone the best of luck. Once a week, three students are selected for Student Athlete of the Week. Um, this week, we are recognizing girls varsity lacrosse captain Maya Salcedo, Maya Salcedo, Morgan Smith from Girls Track, and varsity stunt captain Linnea Holmgren. So congrats to those ladies for standing out this week. Two weeks ago, we hosted our annual dance production in the PAC. Unfortunately for me, but fortunate for the program, the show was sold out all in three days. Um, we've heard amazing feedback and even heard it was very emotional. And I had the opportunity to attend Chaparral's very first Dancing with the Pumas. Um, so basically, a varsity dance member chose a CHS varsity athlete to learn a dance choreographed by the dance member. Um, and let me tell you, I think this was my favorite event so far. It was so entertaining. And let me tell you that some of those boys' hips did not lie, but some of them definitely did. <laughs> Last Friday, we had our annual prom expo. This year, it was in the gym. Um, five senior boys and five girls got to model prom attire. I was one of the models, and it was a really fun experience choosing my dress and walking the show. During the show, our prom theme of Met Gala was revealed. Special thanks to Friar Tux and Macy's for sponsoring the show. We recommend anyone looking for prom attire to, to go check them out. This Thursday, we're going to have our annual spring showcase from 5.30 to 7, and this is a great opportunity for current 8th graders, current or new SHAP students, and parents to come, and families will get to see um, new elective options, have a chance to ask questions about upcoming academic courses, and can even find new clubs or sports to join. And our academic groups, clubs, and sports will have info tables set up, and there's going to be food for sale put on by our Latinos Unidos Club, breakout sessions, and performances. Boys Volleyball is having an orange out next Wednesday, March 22nd. This color is in support of de developmental disability awareness. It's a home game versus TVHS, and we encourage you and community members to come out, dress up in orange, and watch our boys play for a good cause. Let's go Pumas. And we want to shout out a student, Ben Sullivan Douglas, a senior at SHAP, who was honored um, to be rewarded on our K-pop broadcast by principal and counselors, the Certificate of Merit. And he has been selected as a finalist for the National Merit Scholarship Program. And this is a huge accomplishment for Ben, so congrats to him. Today is National Pie Day, and we had a pie eating contest with one freshman, one sophomore, one junior, four seniors, and four staff members. The winners were junior um, Cadence Shike and freshman Allison Fisher, and they got a certificate for a free pizza at Mountain Mike's. And we invite you all to the next improv show this Friday at 7 p.m. in our PAC. Uh, this performance is a long form show, so the team will improvise a two act play based on audience suggestions. And tickets are on sale at chaparralactorstroop.com. Having started this year, the Beach Cleanup Club is doing a great job. Cleaning beaches is not only a win-win situation for the sea creatures affected by the massive amounts of plastic in the ocean, but it can also give students a lot of community service hours, as well as the ability to create new relationships with their fellow club members. Great job to everyone participating. Next week, we're hosting a unified sports softball tournament, and we're super excited to bring all the high schools together and have athletes help out, and good luck to all the teams playing. That concludes our look into March. It's been an amazing month, and we know the greatness will continue here at Chaparral. Thank, Thank you, and have, have a pumatastic day. day. <laughs> Thank you, Noel and Elisa. Next, we'll recognize Lana and Alicia from Temecula Baja High School. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having us again for a refresher. I'm Alicia. And I'm Lana. Getting started. Next week is our biannual drive-in movie in the senior lot. 
and our students will come out to watch Diary of a Wimpy Kid, Roderick Rules, my personal favorite. Um, they love to throw it back with the classics for our generation. Last week was our ASB Executive Board Elections. It's a simple week-long campaign that includes two lunches reserved for a town hall where the student body could interview the candidates to hear their thoughts on what's most important to the student body. Our goal is to provide every student with the best possible high school experience, and it's so important to get to know their perspectives. I ran, and next year I'll serve as President of Culture and Awareness. Last week, a, a number of our culture clubs came together to host a Day of Solidarity event. Um, each club showcased their passions and their focus for the remainder of the year, so they got to work with each other and kind of build off of each other and add more. The month of Marth March honors all the women in our lives and the accomplishments they've made. For the entire month, we are recognizing the strong and dedicated women of all ethnicities and ages who have made an impactful difference in our history, and we're recognizing staff on campus for their contributions. Last week, we had something very new and exciting. It was a nine-hole putt-putt tournament uh, made up of a three, three-hole course. Um, the students loved it, and we had a full windmill to draw attention to the course. We had a full array of an audience every single day. Um, and then a special congratulations to Leila, Leila Benevente and Kimi Arabe for our mini golf champs. <laughs> it's me again. And then during advisement, um, we are offering a series of adult workshops. Uh, last week was interviewing skills. Um, and then this week we have personal finance. And they've been both very interesting and worthwhile. Our students are going to love going through a mock trial interview and talking about what they do best. And a huge congratulations to our Science Olympiad team. They placed fifth overall at regionals over the weekend and are headed to the state competition. We are so proud of everybody and are excited to see what other achievements the team will bring home. And as winter, winter sports, sorry, my voice, I'm getting sick. As winter sports come to an end, we congratulate our GPA championship winners, boys basketball and girls soccer for having the highest average GPA for boys and girls TV teams. And our recent lacrosse games have been super intense. Last home game against Valley Center, our girls varsity lacrosse team entered into double overtime and a big shout out to Aubrey Chang who scored the winning goal. We are beyond proud of our varsity girls lacrosse team and come out to support them on TV this Friday for a home game against SHAP. Um, at the beginning of February, that week is just for our counselors. They always work hard with all of our students and we decorated their office as a surprise to say thank you for all of their efforts. It's counselor week and we awarded our counselors later on in the week with recognitions from our students and sent reminders for our students to appreciate them all of the time because they work every single day very long days and they do so much for us. We also had our jaw dropping Dance Eva with a variety of teams for three nights in a row, Friday being our senior night for our graduating dancers, Ignite, Vitality, Alliance, Beginning Dance, Orchestra, Baile Folklorico, Swing Dance, Ohana, Haka, and Color Guard all performed in the Golden Bear Theater. As always, the audience was super hyped to watch all of the talent talented students on stage. This Friday closes our nine-week progress checkpoint for our students. Very exciting for all of us. Um, and it begins crunch time as we begin to prepare for the end of our school year. A few weeks ago, we traveled back to the 2000s with the Y2K Spirit Day. The entire school, even staff, mem staff members, participated and wore all sorts of throwback clothes that were denim, low-rise, baggy, and glam. I took the Spirit Day to a whole new level because I brought my dad's old-fashioned camera as a prop and I even took photos on it, so that was really cool. Some of our juniors began taking the cast this week, also very exciting for them, and the goal for the class of 2024 is to improve the percentage of all passings for the three tests by 2% each. Perhaps a highlight for February was our Cubs on Campus event where we brought over more than 700 eighth graders to campus for tours, presentations, and the chance to talk to the student representatives from all of the club sports and activities. There was a lot of energy, and the current students are so proud to get to share their passions and get others excited that the eighth graders were wide-eyed at all the options that they offered. And that concludes a little bit about what we've been having on on our campus in the past month. Of course, we would love to go on and on, but we just don't have the time for that. Um, but thank you for this opportunity. It's been fun. I'm Lana. And I'm Alicia. And, and stay, stay golden. golden. Thanks, Alana and Alicia. <laughs> Next up, I'd like to recognize Noel and Alisa from Great Oak Wolfpack. And excuse me, that was slightly out of order. It's my fault.
Hello, everyone. My name is Alyssa, and I'm so glad to be back to let you know what, have, what, have, what has been going on at Great Oak. Starting off with the arts, the symphonic and jazz band had a preview concert at the Old Town Community Theater. We are so lucky to be able to perform such a beautiful in such a beautiful place on a beautiful night for the city of Temecula. Warner Guard attended the WGASC Riverside King Show and Drumline hosted the SCPA Temecula Regional Show at Great Oak this past weekend. The Great Oak Theater is presenting Mamma Mia this Thursday, Friday, and Saturday in the PAC. They have put, on, put in so much hard work for the show to be the best and the school cannot wait to see it. All right, getting into sports. Uh, girls, boys, and girls and boys basketball shared the league champs. Uh, girls water polo, boys soccer, girls basketball, and boys basketball made it to CIF playoffs, and three wrestlers from Great Oak went to CIF Masters. Uh, for mountain biking, Raul Gutierrez placed first on February 13th. Uh, this Friday, we are hosting the Special Olympics here at Great Oak. ASB and WSB students will be setting up different games and events throughout the day. Everyone is incredibly excited for this big event and can, can't wait to get together to play some amazing games. At the end of the month, we, are, we have another unified, ga unified Games event. It will be held at Chaparral High and the students will be playing softball. Uh, Science Olympiad came in first in the regional competition and will be competing in state ch in the state competition. Our very own senior Chase Ruffin got, into, got appointed to West Point Military Academy. Good job, Chase. This month's activities has been an absolute blast. Last week was our Nickelodeon themed spirit week and a spring sports rally. On Tuesday, we wore pink in honor of fairly odd parents. Wednesday was monochrome for Yo Gabba Gabba. Thursday was dressed like a kid day for Rugrats and of course Red Day on Friday for our rally and assembly. For the rally, we had performances by dance, cheer, stunt, step, and Ohana Nananui. During the rally, we slimed a staff member and a student that was voted upon by the students. This week, peer leaders are putting on a social media awareness week. They are sending out announcements everywhere, sharing the positive effects of lessening our social media usage. They, they encourage students to take a break from social media just to get away from it and take some time from themselves from, for finding other entertaining activities. Even something as simple as hanging out with a friend without looking at their phone to live in the moment. <coughs> Next week to get us started for spring break, freshman WSB will, be put, will put on the spring egg hunt for the entire school. Over 2,000 eggs filled with candy or tickets for prizes are hidden throughout the campus, prizes ranging from a pixie stick to a mini fridge. We cannot wait to win some amazing prizes. Last week, the five, um, five leadership teachers from GOHS had the opportunity to share the amazing school culture with well over 400 individuals from across the county, <laughs> across the country. People were amazed at the amazing things that are going on at Great Oak. Thank you so much for your time, and I cannot wait to see you at the next meeting in April. Go Wolfpack. Thanks, Lisa. Next up, we have Anthony and Enrique from Rancho Vista High School. Good evening, board members. I am Samantha Rowden. I am filling in for Enrique. And I'm Anthony Marquez. We are from Rancho Vista High School, and we are delighted to share the great things happening around campus to ensure student success. We kicked off second semester with Rancho Strong Week. During this week, we hosted many activities to bond as a school. This was a great way to assist new students to adjust to our school and meet new people before classes started and the hard work kicks in. In February, we celebrated Spirit Week during Valentine's Week. To highlight this week of activities, ASB sold Cupid grams and made Valentine's hearts for every student to spread love and kindness. Additionally, BSU helped us celebrate and learn about Black History Month. We shared an honoring famous African Americans who accomplished great things. ASB collaborated with um, BSU to share chocolate chip cookies in honor of famous Amos and his creation. We also shared heart lollipops to celebrate the first heart surgeon, Dr. Charles Drew, and we had a potato chip tasting contest to celebrate George Crumb, who created the potato chip. 
<laughs> this month we are celebrating Women's History Month. March is a celebration of women's contributions in history, culture, and society. Who doesn't love a great chocolate chip cookie? We can say thank you to Ruth Wakefield for this delicious snack. She was the first to discover how to make the chocolate chips stay intact while baking cookies. For the remainder of March, we will continue to highlight and celebrate all women around the world. We would also like to give a shout out to our campus security, Mr. Derek, Miss Stephanie, and Mr. Raymond. Derek and Stephanie have been with us for a while and have never failed to keep us safe while also getting to know all of us and making us feel comfortable. Raymond is the newest addition to the Rancher family and has left a good impression with all of us. He's always doing his job fully motivated and giving it his 100%. From all the kids at Rancho, we want to thank them for being there for us. Thank you. Thank you, Samantha. Thank you. Next up, I'd like to recognize TVA Spotlight with Edgar Diaz. Hey, good evening, everyone, board and staff. Uh, the last two Saturdays, TVA has partnered with Community Mission of Hope to rehabilitate a home by cleaning, prepping, and painting the interior of that home. Uh, this home when completed will allow family from the area to have a stable housing. Teachers, including Christy Jin, Lisa Yoder, Carrie Bodemer, Jamie Vaughn, led energetic groups of high school students. I mean, this house needed a lot of TLC. They cleaned walls, ceilings, fixtures, refrigerators. One, one of those things, parents, that when you tell your child, hey, can you clean the, clean the stove for me? They're like, no, they clean this stove clean. This is just one individual. So it seriously can happen. And with some elbow grease, those students made some magic happen for that house. It was completed, painted on the interior on Saturday, and they're gonna continue some additional work, but they will, um, most of those high schoolers put a lot of work into making that house somewhere cozy for someone to live. Uh, currently, TVA is in the midst of our executive board elections. Uh, Two-year terms are open for seats as vice president, treasurer, special education area rep, high school area, middle school area rep, and elementary area rep. Uh, those positions are elected from groups of teachers that are within those uh, representative groups or those teacher groups, uh, and they represent the, those groups in our exec board. So they kind of bring their voice into our decision making as we can. We also have members vying for positions on California Teacher Association State Council that provides direction for our statewide union. Uh, so there are represent we have three representatives that go to our to the CTA State Council. They vote on policy. They vote on whatever they have. Uh, sometimes people think like, oh, CTA, it's this nebulous cloud that's out there, but it's actually our members that are going out there, members from each local that go out and vote on the issues that matter to them. We also have representatives going to the National Educator Association Representative Assembly this summer. Uh, these two are large democratic bodies where local unions send their representatives to bring business to the floor. Uh, they are discussed and voted on by the whole body. The NEARA has more than 5,000 delegates listening and voting uh, on particular issues. I've been there. 5,000 people saying yay or nay is very impressionable when you're there and the discussions that are there uh, are had from a wide variety of issues that come up, um, but it's all member driven so anyone can bring a new business item to the floor to be discussed. Uh, those are powerful experiences for our members and it speaks to the power of our democratic organization from our local to the state and to the national body. Uh, on Thursday at TVA's Leadership Council, there was a concern about the cost associated with the budget item concerning the CRT and the impact of the teacher sessions during that workday. Our body discussed how the dollar amount could be used to support rising supply costs for classroom materials. The shortage of subs on a daily basis also left a concern about the type of instruction uh, if a substitute is not able to fill a particular class when the attending teacher is out. In an elementary setting, classes are collapsed, impacting colleagues. In the second le secondary level, teachers give up their prep period and are compensated at the hourly rate, which can dramatically increase the substitute cost. Ultimately, the body voted to inform, inform members that they should attend as long as they're on a voluntary basis and they're comfortable with attending. Now, I'll let you know that uh, leaving the classroom for educators is a big investment of time. Uh, we're always looking for an idea or strategies that we, have, that we can apply to our curriculum. Uh, based on the video I watched of Mr. Arend, it was heavy on ideas without curriculum application. Why does that matter? Many of our elementary teachers will spend three to five hours writing sub plans for all six, all six subjects and preparing the room for the day. So it's not just only the cost of the 
time that goes into it, uh, preparing, getting things ready, but then also on the back end. If you're an educator, you know that when you come back, there's always a resettling. You know, Things might have happened, might not have happened, and you have to ha adjust on where you are, and that's all affecting on your curriculum that you've planned out already for a few weeks. So for educators, that time investment is also at the cost of family time uh, after the work clock has stopped to be able to establish your plans, set them up, and then to be able to catch up on the backside. Before you are also three MOUs negotiated with TBA. While our contract is settled, we welcome discussions with TBUSD to problem solve on unintended consequences, ideas, or new situations that develop in the course of our coordinated bargaining agreement. The first is elementary case management for RSP and SDC teachers. While educators did not feel the amount of support was enough, they felt obligated to accept it to have some time provided uh, to test students and write out IEPs. Many had taken personal leave days uh, from the beginning of the school year, so that's from August all the way to where are we at now, March, uh, to basically they took their personal leave, they stayed at school, and they tested students to be able to uh, meet their IEP needs and meet the obligations they have for an IEP with a parent to be able to have the, the information there. Uh, and this part of a solution is, this is part of a solution to a burgeoning problem where special education teachers are pulled in so many directions that executing their job responsibilities is not at the level they expect. They have high expectations of themselves, high expectations of what they want to deliver with parents, and so they usually look for ways to be able to do that, and many of our teachers sacrifice a lot of their personal time to be able to complete them. Demand for special education services has grown and our educators are feeling the stress of delivering the program that they are proud of. But should it come at the sacrifice of their personal lives with their families or to their personal health as they are dedicating so much of that time to be able to meet those needs outside of contract hours. So although we didn't think it was a great solution at it, they are still taking it because they want something. And so in appreciation of that, uh, while consulting that group, they wanted to accept the MOU as written, although we will continue to advocate for more support for those two um, special education groups. The next two MOUs concern realigning pay schedules for small groups of our educators in career technical education and speech language pathologists. Both MOUs helped us develop a pay scale that is competitive to neighboring districts and, and more importantly, to retain our new to the profession individuals. Uh, they are mid so that People don't come to TVSD, take a training here, take a job, and then leave us for a job that is fifteen to $20,000 more. Now, everyone always just looks at the salary scale, but to let you know that as far as things are bargained, everything's a little different. Every district has a little bit of a nuance, particularly when we look at SLPs like in Marietta, someone might say. They work an hour, an hour long, longer every day, and they work extra days to the year. Our members did not want to do that, but wanted to make sure that they were more competitive on that level so they didn't feel like they needed to leave. Because they all, what they all say is, they all love working here at TVSD. I've been through a lot of site visits throughout the year. I think I'm five away from getting all 28 or nine. Or I don't know how many we got, I lost count. Uh, but that's, the, that's basically what I get from our educators. They love working here, they want to see how they can make an impact, and they just want to feel supported while they're doing their jobs. Uh, you also have an action item before you to increase staffing for counselors in middle and high school. Supporting our students is dependent on the amount of attention we can focus on an individual. With our current ratio, counselors are responsible for three to 500 students, severely limiting the type of interactions. In the high school scenario, student loads will fall for each counselor, while at the middle school, current job duties are removed that frees up type to meet students for our tier one support. Now, while this was not bargained uh, with TVEA, this is, came as a it was ideas were developed in conjunction with TVA to allow those individuals to do what they do best is work with students and not have to deal with um, like IC stuff or uh, at least in the middle school to remove themselves from IEP meetings and other issues that may remove them from working with their students at their caseload. Thank you very much. Good evening. Thank you, Edgar. <laughs> Next, I'd like to recognize CSEA Spotlight with Andrew. Enriquez. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Andrew Enriquez, and I'm a 28-year employee of Temecula Valley Unified School District. I have probably been, some of the grown-ups that are in this room have probably, I've worked with over the course of my years in this district. Over those 28 years, I have seen board members come and go. I have seen administrators come and go. 
this is the first time in that 28 year history of mine that we have gone without a contract for now going on nine months. We are making progress, yes. I am not saying that we are not making any kind of progress. You've got two MOUs regarding jobs that we brought forward. You also have our joint uh, agreement of what we're gonna bring forward for openers, but we're opening things that we haven't even closed yet. So that's a concern of mine and my chapters. Also, as it was a joint agreement or a joint bringing forward, I haven't seen what the district's openers are. So that's concerning to me as well. So, um, I, I don't know why. I didn't realize that it was going to be joint today. I think probably in the process, I may have forgotten, to, to be fair to the district. But I don't know what those openers are for the district. The district knows what ours are. In that 28 years, I have seen this district and the conditions that our employees, classified employees, have had to face to get progressively worse. One of the things that we have brought forward in our negotiations is what's called Article 22. And if you look into our contract, you'll see that Article 22 is the discipline article. Currently, our discipline article has no checks and balances for the district to conduct business with the discipline. As of now, we have had at least seven to 10 employees that have faced this various, the various forms of correction and discipline where steps have been skipped. We have been told that it is egregious that the steps were skipped because the, the event was egregious. We haven't gotten a definition of egregious, of egregious. They have been held accountable above and beyond maybe some other classifications or even some other uh, bargaining unit members. We are asking for some conditions to be met. We're asking at the table, not here, but at the table. But with those asks, that particular part of our, art, of our contract may be held up. We don't know yet. We'll know. We, we meet the twelfth next Wednesday. So I'll be able to report back to you maybe at the next board meeting during my two minutes or three minutes. But I hope that we can come to an agreement on this because the morale is low. Putting everything that we went through back in 2020 till now aside, the, the, the conditions are at an all-time low for our classified employees. They, they are overworked because the pools are short. Our custodians, as you heard from one of the teachers mention, they're being driven into the ground with what is going on at the sites. The district believes that team cleaning is the answer. Team cleaning has not worked in the last 15 years. I've got custodian after custodian hurting, not dying, but struggling to try and keep these schools clean. We are talking a, a school the size of Bella Vista where two custodians will clean it. An elementary school the size of French Valley where maybe one or two will be able to clean it. The expectation is that our kids come to a clean school. Our employees are busting their butts to do it, but under the current conditions, they cannot keep it up. They've tried. If you look back and see what happened over the summer, because of the shortages, because of how hard they were being driven, and they were not at work, we did not finish our summer cleaning until we started school. So the fact that Mr. Campos brought it up should tell you that this is an important, another important thing. We look at what happens to our instructional assistants that are stretched beyond compare, trying to help our kids. There's shortages there. They're struggling. They're doing the best that they can. But when you hear the rumors or you hear what's happened and they know what happens to their fellow employees with regards to discipline, they're not coming or giving their 100% because they're afraid. Our campus security is afraid because they've seen their coworkers go. They've seen their coworkers dismissed or they've seen their coworkers resign because it is just that cut and dry sometimes. There isn't a chance. So with that, uh, I, liked, I, I, I would uh, like you guys to vote yes for those two MOUs because we're going to end on a positive note. I would like you to agree to the openers on our side. They're very important to us. And I would also like to let you guys know that during the summer, much like Mr. Diaz, 
we are going to a conference as well. The, the Classified School Employees Union holds a conference every year. This year, it's in Reno. I've never been to Reno, so it's going to be very interesting. But we also conduct our business where we have five to 6,000 employees voting the will of, the, of, the, of CSCA. And it's an amazing site. And we, we open it up. We have our meeting this Thursday to, for nominations. I get to go because, yay, I'm president. So I don't have to be nominated. But nominations will be taken from the floor. And hopefully we'll be able to have some members go in and experience, like Mr. Diaz says, it's very eye-opening. It's very jaw-dropping. And sometimes it's intimidating. But with the experience of the folks that do go taking the newbies, it's always a great time. So with that, I say thank you. You guys have a wonderful evening. And also I want to recognize my uh, labor, rep labor relations representative, Mr. Gary Schneider, is here today to, to hang out with us. So as again, thank you very much. You all have a wonderful evening, and I'll talk to you later. You too. Thank you, Andrew. We don't have a PTA speaker tonight, so we'll move to public comments. Governing board welcomes public comments. This is the time for open session public comments. Public comments are allowed up to a maximum of three minutes per comment in the order received to a maximum of 30 minutes per item for comments on agenda items or non-agenda items. For consent agenda item topics, a limit of three minutes will be allowed from one speaker. Unless the item has been placed on the published agenda in accordance with the Brown Act, there shall be no action taken. No discussion will be made regarding personal issues in open session. All public comments are an important part of the board meeting and are given careful consideration by the governing board. And with that, I just want to make a quick announcement. Uh, if you have a burning desire while you're giving a public comment to approach the dais, please do not do so. While your intentions might be good and pure, we don't know that here at the board and we'll perceive you as a possible threat. So no more approaching the dais. And with that, um, are there any remaining public comments on the agenda items this evening and which items? 15 now, 10 minutes. Okay, so we have 15 public comments. Um, I could clock at two minutes per public comment. Mm -hmm. Danny, Mrs. Barclay, Steve, we got 15 public comments. We could do two minutes apiece and get all 15 in 30 minutes. Yeah, three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. Okay, we'll hear all uh, 15 speakers at three minutes. And um, another important note: when when we're giving you a 30-second uh, interruption, I know sometimes that's slightly interrupted for the speaker, but we have to just keep you on track so that when your three minutes expire, we're giving you a heads up. So maybe we'll do a little wave as well, keep it soft. Hey, um, do you mind if I uh, just pose a, an option? Can we maybe ask the speaker if they want a 30 second warning? Give them the option if they don't want the 30 second, when the time's up, time's up? Possibly, but. I think it's good to keep it consistent yeah, personally. Yeah. So Dr. McClay, what do you think? I know one student mentioned that it, it kind of interrupts the flow, and I totally want to be cognizant of that. Um, but on the other hand, we want to make sure we're consistent across the board. So my thought was maybe we could have a flag or something, just so we know. I know it's on the board, but when I've spoken before, I know sometimes you don't, you don't see it. So Dr. McClay, what do you think? I think it's up to the board, but consistency would be my vote if I had a would vote. Mine. We'll give a 30 second comment a reminder until we uh, go to the governing handbook. And then but we we'll think that through. We, yeah. we hear you and we'll think that through. So. Okay, first speaker we have Steve Campos. Good evening, Cabinet. Um, I kind of have changed now what I'm going to talk about. First, I want to thank the board for the CRT presentation. Uh, that's money well spent. I can tell you that the 1619 project is not a good expense in case we are thinking about purchasing it. And if so, then we should also purchase a 1776 project to present both sides so we can have and promote true critical thinking. Uh, number one, Jen, I know last week there was a, a mention of you not attending a chaparral event. I would personally like to invite you, I get a plus one as an employee, to any chaparral event that you want to go, if it's the step team, whatever it is, I would love to join you and your husband if you can make yourself available. So thank you for all that you do. Um, and then uh, last time, uh, one of my colleagues discussed kind of the concern of the instability here at uh, Temecula Valley. Uh, one of the things that I've noticed over the, my 17 years is the district has been unstable for about 10 years. Uh, we've had this issue with the SLPs for about a decade. And the, and the people that are sitting up here, some of them, not all of them, have been able to control the salary schedule of our SLPs, and they have not done so. 
and it's been over a decade because this has been an issue for a long time. And so therefore, I just want to make sure that people are clear in how that is set up. Safety, Andy, thank you for your, uh, your presentation because that was a great one. Uh, safety, we need, it's a big concern. You know, we, ha we hire three and a half hour campus security. Who wants a three and a half campus security job? We need full-time staff, and I know people worry about the benefits and the cost, but what is the cost for our kids' safety? I don't understand that. We should be hiring people, the right people, because that person who's a three and a half employee, half hour uh, employee, they're gonna end up taking a job that gives them benefits. And so obviously, to me, it's really simple. When we hire our campus security, give them full-time jobs. They're great workers, they're worth their weight in gold. Um, the other thing, too, that, that we mentioned about, you know, some of these instabilities, the low pay. That is something that the board members have not controlled. The low pay for our subs is the fault of the cabinet for the past 10 years. We've been the lowest on the schedule for 10 years. I've been advocating for that through safety and other committees, and it's never changed. And so finally, I hope we have the leadership that is going to go ahead, just like uh, Mr. Diaz said, I hope that we are considering that every time we don't have a sub, that there are... Uh, we're paying teachers their per diem. Now, really quickly, as a TVA member, I've been a part of, I've been to state council. I'm, I'm a six-year uh, member of state council. I've been to six, uh, actually, this is going to be my sixth RA this summer. I've invested in TVA. So TVA members, I want seconds. you to know that I have served you for 12 out of 17 years, and I want to advocate for step 28. First of all, uh, protect staff and safety and a medical bridge for 55. Thank you, and I'd be honored, TVA members, for your vote of support. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Campos. Next up, we have Christy McClure. Thank you. People moved to Temecula for the schools. That's how our family ended up here, the public schools, the ones that follow standard curriculum and aren't free range, do whatever you want. And if this is a public school system in California that's bound by California State, Riverside State County Departments of Education rules and guidelines, why is our district so much better? I would argue that a big factor is the teaching staff. My husband and I have had kids in TVUSD on and off since 1998, and we still do. We've interacted with dozens of teachers, volunteering on campuses, at school events, parent-teacher conferences. They are incredible, and they know what they are doing. They know how to teach difficult topics like math, how to write an essay, history, and even the civil rights movement in a way that is age appropriate. Teachers tend to stay with the same general grade levels, right? You don't have a high school teacher suddenly teaching kindergarten one year, sixth grade the next, and then back to high school. They often stay with the same grade even for their entire career, honing their skills and really knowing the age group and how to teach age appropriately. This debate about, quote, CRT being taught in schools is a lesson in misinformation and micromanaging. This resolution is not about CRT. It is about telling teachers what they can and can't say in the classroom. That is akin to my manager's boss sitting next to me at work and telling me what I can and can't put in an email. It's not even that. It's like the CEO sitting next to me telling me how to do the details of my job. You hire them to do a job. They have the training and experience. They have been through orientation. They have in-services at their site and through the district, ongoing grade level meetings, and other activities to hone their skills. Stop wasting district money on fake CRT exports and resolutions that have nothing to do with CRT, but tell teachers what they can and can't say in a classroom about American history. There are times when kids will learn something at school or interpret something in a way that either causes them to feel anguish or goes against the family values. When that happens, we as parents talk to our kids. We find out what happened and we help them make sense of the world. Maybe a kid is upset to find out that Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated or that someone told them that Santa Claus isn't real. Regardless of the issue, the solution is my parenting. Perhaps contacting the teacher and or the school directly if needed, but not a school board telling a teacher what kids can and can't hear at school. You are wasting taxpayers' dollars, our money, on so-called experts on CRT because you're uncomfortable 30 seconds. with your children hearing things at school that don't line up to your personal family values. And by the way, I have worked with subject matter experts in my career for years, and these do not qualify or meet any standard definition of SME that I've ever seen. Let TVUSD teachers do their jobs. They are amazing. If they weren't, TVUSD wouldn't have the reputation it has, and it wouldn't be the reason so many people move here. Families move here for the schools. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Kerr. Next up, we have Mr. Will Pena. 
Mr. Pena. Nope. All right, just to remind everybody, this is a public school board, not a Christian one. Okay? Since CRT is a topic, let me give you another one, a familiar, a familiar acronym, STFU. In John 3.18, we are told, little children, let us not love in word and talk, but in deed and truth. Right now, there's one such church that is not a place that preaches truth about Jesus Christ or tries to do his good work. Generally speaking, it is a loud, angry, judgmental, and biblically illiterate self-worship. After that church learns about STFU, perhaps it can get back to doing the things based on kindness, forgiveness, love, and mercy, qualities that be used to be considered Christian values. It is time to put away standard issue evangelical ideology and political agenda. In the words of Jesus in John 13, 35, the message is clear. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. Jesus is about embracing a way of life, and that way of life is humble and quiet, built on a faith that heals the sick, welcomes the foreigner, serves the poor, forgives, and shows mercy. The truth here is not complicated. The teachings of Jesus are of great value and could help many people live better and more fulfilling lives, while, excuse me, whether they actively believe in God. That's especially true for the millions of evangelists, Christians that have completely ignored and abandoned the teachings of Jesus. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pena. Next up, we have Mrs. Jen Reeves. Mrs. Reeves. Nonpartisan, not partisan, especially free from party affiliation, bias, or designation, i.e., a nonpartisan ballot or a nonpartisan board. That is what this school board is supposed to be a body of elected people that take every student into account and work to do what is best for each of them. The religious ideology or political affiliation of the members of the board should not even be discussed because they should have no bearing on the decisions made by this board. Unfortunately, that is not what's happening here. Some members of this board want to force their truth to become the truth. They want everyone to align with their religious and political ideology, and they have no interest in how that may impact the people and the community around them. They preach love, but they support people who bully and harass community members. They claim to want to listen, but refuse to allow all sides to be represented. This community and these schools are made up of a wide variety of people from every walk of life, and that is a beautiful thing. I hope this board can become aware of this and truly represent all these students as they are. Not try and force these kids to align only with your beliefs. Thank you. Mr. Penreal, always. It is Ben Real always. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, Shakran for having me here today. Um, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I want to start off by introducing myself. It's me, Daoud Akmera. Uh, my Arabic name is Dawood Akmera. Uh, my mother gave me an American name, Don Caldwell, because it was safe. So I, I, it is what it is. Um, I'm sorry to inconvenience you with the fake name. I just wanted to know what it felt like to be an adult clown that gives fake names like uh, Slim Pickens and Ben <laughs> Richards and Bryce Henson, whatever he wants to call himself. Unfortunately, not here today to hear me say this. Um, I missed the last. My, my last chance to speak the last couple of times, um, but I did listen. I listened to everybody, the good, the bad, the ugly. I, and, you know, it, here's the thing, all right? I'm a black Muslim American that resides in Temecula, right? I didn't grow up here, but I live here now. My kids live here. My kids go to school in this school district. They love the school district, right? They love the schools they go to. My kids are in school right now, not my kids went to school 20 years ago here, or I went to school here and it was like this. My kids actually go to school here now. 
And um, I want them to learn history. I don't want them to be shorted on their history, okay? Uh, quick story about me. Um, I grew up, I went through 9-11, all right? I'm Muslim, I went through 9-11, I got the ridicule. I still stood up and I took an oath to fight against terrorism, foreign and domestic, for this country. I learned CRT as a young kid and it didn't stop me from being friends with people that weren't black. It didn't make me feel like people didn't, uh, they wanted to treat me unfair. Wh whatever that was, I I, it happens, but I didn't stop being friends with people that weren't black. So for the people that have an issue saying that, oh, what's gonna make my kids feel some type of way? I'm here to debunk that, I'm here right now. I have friends that aren't black. I have friends that are Latino. I have friends that are white. I have friends that are Asian. I have seconds. friends that are Jewish. I have friends that are Christian. I have friends, I have family as Jehovah Witness. I have family, friends that are everything. It didn't stop me or make me feel hate anybody. So I don't know who's telling this story saying that, oh, it's gonna make people hate somebody or make other people feel some type of way. I'm here to tell you that's bogus. 11 years of military service, five years in the Marine Corps, six years in the Army, two de combat deployments, five total deployments, and I still stood and helped everybody. Thank you, Mr. Caldwell, and thank you for your service. Next up, Miles Ross. Mr. President, members of the board, and staff, good evening. My name is Miles Ross, and I'm the NAACP branch president, 1034. And like my predecessor, I too am a minister. I'm here today to provide an update about the NAACP branch, 1034, which represents the communities of Temecula, Murrieta, Wildemar, Sun City, Menifee, Paris, Canyon Lake, Lake Elsinore, Corona, and Norco. It has been since 1977 that we have grown in these communities with supporters in this area. Before I address some important community concerns that bring me to this meeting, I wish to remind your board about my organization. First, the NAACP was, formed, was founded in 1909 and is the nation's oldest and largest civil rights organization. From the ballot box to the classroom, the thousands of dedicated workers, organizers, leaders, members who make up the NAACP continue to fight for social justice for all Americans. The mission of the National Association of the Advancement of Colored People is to secure the political, educational, social and economic equality of rights in order to eliminate race-based discrimination and ensure the health and well-being of all persons. As we have been reading and hearing about measures that have been proposed or taken by a majority of this board of trustees over the last few weeks, the first thing that came to mind is the ungrammatical rejoinder that if it ain't broke, don't fix it. And it does appear to us that at least the majority of this board is well on the way of breaking one of the magnets that has cons cons consistently drawn prospective residents and visitors to this beautiful area, especially those with school-aged children. We are particularly concerned about the dominant issue of the day, the code word use of critical race the theory or CRT to prevent teaching of proportions of American history, all without accuracy and honestly, honestly defining the term itself. 30 seconds. For the, for the record, critical race theory is not new, only 
It is aggressively false and misleading to use by some, some is new. CRT was first developed by legal scholars in 1930 in the 80s following the civil rights movement. movement. It was in part a response to the erroneous notions that social society and its institutions were colorblind. <clears throat> we are Thank you, Mr. Ross. Next up, Haley Stout. Good evening, I'm Haley Stout and I've been a student at this district for nine years. To start, if the school board is genuinely concerned about student safety, why is there a board member publicly shaming students on social media? At least two students are being publicly bullied by grown adults who attend these meetings, whether they sit in front of me or behind me. Um, sorry. Uh, many people come up to talk who do not attend the school, direct, the level, sorry. <laughs> school district or have students. Um, Oh my gosh, where was I? I'm sorry. <laughs> um, they talk about not criticizing our board members, but make hateful comments towards the other. They also spread misinformation about what we're taught in schools and how we're taught in schools. There was also a man who came up about his safety. Sorry. <laughs> there was also a man who came up worried about his own safety about protesting in front of our schools. If you're so concerned about your safety, possibly do not harass students in front of our schools. I'm tired of having my friends and family worried about their own, like, oh my gosh, I got lost. I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Take your time. You <laughs> Thank you. Um, students' voices should not be suppressed by those who do not live here, do not attend here, or, oh God, oh my gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo, I'm sorry. <laughs> Students should not be ignored by the board members or anyone else. We are what make up your schools. Just because you're paid to sit in these seats does not mean you get to treat us like money trees. Mm. To add, threats to, di blah, blah, sorry. <laughs> threats to discipline students during the walkouts. These walkouts are our First Amendment right. If you're, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> the walkouts are our First Amendment right of our U.S. Constitution, just as those who use their First Amendment rights to speak hate speech in front of our schools. We deserve to be heard and listened to. We are the only ones who are truly affected by the decisions you make here as a board. Letting grown adults harass students here within the board meeting, whether it makes the students uncomfortable or they try to follow them out of the meeting is wrong, and I would like all of you to address it, whether you have or you haven't. Thank you. Thanks, Haley. Next up, we have Kelly Maxey. Kelly Maxey. Good evening. I'm here tonight basically to talk about money. I don't think I need uh, a 30 second reminder since my speech won't be that long. Okay, my name is Kelly Maxey and I'd like to start by sharing an audio clip with you. Uh, I don't know how easy it's gonna be to hear through this microphone, so let me kind of set the stage. This is an interview that Christopher Arend gave to TV Santa Barbara. It's an hour long video and available on YouTube. I'd like to highlight just the last minute of this interview. They can always ask me to, if a group gets together and wants to learn more, they can always ask me to come down and, uh, and give a lecture, as I've been doing. About all I ask for is, school, is gas money nowadays, <laughs> but uh, that's the way I like Okay, in case you could not make out what was said, that was Christopher Aaron speaking about the lectures he gives about CRT and offering to, pro to provide the training for gas money. Um, he said he'd do it for, for gas money. That $15,000 is a lot of gas money. In my opinion, hiring Christopher Arend or really any of the CRT panels should be a no-go. CRT is a non-issue in TVUSD, and for the record, I resent the time, money, and resources being spent on this non-issue. We should be focused on our students and our educational programs in TVUSD. 
And Danny, I recently sent you an email with a couple suggestions on how $15,000 of the general fund could be used in the classroom. I sent you a highlight video of my robotics class and my 3D design class, and that $15,000 would go a long way in my class. And I'm sure you could ask any teacher and they could give you a thousand other reasons how that money could be better spent. So here's a deal to all of you. This decision is fiscally irresponsible. So before you vote tonight on whether or not to hire Christopher Aaron and spend $15,000, or more likely $30,000, because it will cost the teacher subs, I ask you to please remember how the general fund should be used. It should be used to spend money on the students and the educational programs in TVUSD. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Next up, we have Mrs. Carrie Burdick Roots, or Rutz, excuse me if I mispronounced that. Hello, um, I'm Carrie Burdick Rutz. I've been here a long time. Um, I've taught at Margarita Middle School, Chaparral, Great Oak High School. Uh, we've raised three kids in the district. They went to Tony Tobin, Vale Ranch, and Great Oak. Um, I'm coming to speak on some concerns about the CRT resolution that you've made a ban on CRT when it's also not a subject we teach. So then therefore, you're banning the topics around CRT as you've described in your resolution. Um, but now that's against what the state curriculum is that teachers are to teach. So now you've said words that we're not supposed to say in class or topics we're not supposed to cover in class, but yet it's a state standard that we do teach it. So that's contradictory to what teachers' credentials say they have to do from the state of California. Um, one of my other concerns is the intimidation factor that teachers are already feeling. Um, when Dr. Karaski and Mrs. Wiersma went on Fox News, Fox News asked them what would be next. And they said, well, now it's time to get the boots on the ground to have students and parents report rogue teachers and to get the administrators to enforce this ban. So that is the intimidation that you are trying to put on teachers where now they're worried about the words they say in class. They're worried like, oh, am I gonna get home and now have emails from parents saying, oh, what was that? Why did you say that? When that is the state curriculum, the teachers are well-trained. We've been well-trained. They're age appropriate. We know the curriculum. And it should not be from threats of intimidation or worried of extra time spent after school to talk to the principal, to talk to the parent, to write the emails, to go and double check the lessons to try to soften it or hide some of the history that you uh, seem to be wanting to block. We need to teach all the history, all the curriculum, the good and the bad. The teachers are good enough to teach it, they're excellent. The students are strong enough to learn it and hear it. And they already do, they already know it. And I, I feel it might be a disconnect between some of you um, understanding how kids can interact today. 30 seconds. They're very well versed in diversity, in history. And they point out when it's been neglected in class. They will tell you, what about this? Like, oh right, well I didn't get to that today or we'll bring that up later. So it's naive to think the kids don't know what's happening. So please don't spend that money. My desk is painted, the handles are different, my chair is squeaky and ripped. I put out five new markers today and the kids were excited. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> Next up we have Christy Rutz Robbins. Christy Rutz Robbins.
try to get that close enough. I tend to have a soft voice. Hi, I'm Dr. Rutz Robbins. You might remember me. I did sit up there for a good 12 years. So I know what it's like. I actually have PTSD from all these people, all these nice folks, all you wonderful Americans, doing your thing, you know, being raucous, whatever. That's democracy. It's supposed to be like that. We've had dissent from the beginning of our government. That's how we were founded, on dissent. That's the most American thing we do. So I want to point out a couple things. You pulled me out of retirement, thanks. I was trying not to do this. <laughs> per ed code, state law, local boards implement curriculum. We don't make curriculum. So that's the first thing I need to point out. State law, we implement curriculum. We're not making it. The state has content standards and frameworks. The state of California made our curriculum. Teachers must teach that. So the standards and the framework include teaching about the legacies of slavery as well as the economic and social inequalities today. That is in our frameworks. So we have to make sure that this CRT resolution you passed doesn't prevent teachers from doing the job they must do. We must teach about racism in our society. It's critical. Obviously, we're all having a big fight about race and racism and how it fits into our society right now. This is the time we need to talk about it. Your board policy says, 6142.94, that your training is going to be content standards aligned. This is not. CRT training is not content standards aligned. So you'll be violating your own board policy by moving forward on this. I just don't recommend it. Plus, it's causing division. I don't recommend that either. You're going to have PTSD too. Trust me. <laughs> you really are. And lastly, censorship is un-American. It's un-American. <laughs> Telling teachers that they can't teach that racism is ordinary is what's in that language. When racism is common, we know it. Our kids know it. My kids know it. I have kids in public school here still, at least one. Um, they know it. We do not want to be in the company of countries that censor, like China, Russia, 30 seconds. South Korea, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan. That is not the group that we want to affiliate with. So I want you to walk it back. Like, take a think for a minute. Critical thinking is what we teach, what we do, what we value. We can do that. We can do that, and we should. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rex Robbins. Next, we have Mr. Ronald Prentice. Uh, thanks. Um, I realize that uh, the new members of the board here ran campaigns that stress the need for parents to have more influence over uh, their child's education. And I think this is reasonable, and historically parents have had a say in such things as sex education and uh, di disciplinary uh, policies. Unfortunately, due to our current uh, very divisive political moment, many parents want a say in how various academic courses are, uh, are taught. And as uh, Rutz Robbins has mentioned, uh, this causes tension between what needs to be taught uh, to meet educational standards from the state uh, and independent accreditation agencies and what the parents want. As much as these new board members would like to respond to the concerns of their constituents, I would hope they would carefully listen to the educational professionals, the teachers, Dr. McClary and her, McClay and her staff, um, uh, who have expertise in these educational matters. Uh, my personal view is that educational standards should be upheld and that nothing should be off limits in educational discussions within the humanities. In particular, it is a disservice to our students to try and sugarcoat or elide the uh, disgraceful uh, episodes in our history. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Prentice. Next up, we have Mr. John Montiel. doing thank you for having me here um, you know I heard a lot of good things here today you know and, and um, a lot of a lot of good opinions and stuff you know and 
And you know what? What the one thing that I'm I I tend to ask myself is you know, you know you wonderful teachers. You know you guys got all these degrees. You know, but you know what what ha you know and we want to listen to you guys. But but what happened to the parents? What happened to the parents in this whole situation? You know these are our kids. You know you don't get a right to come up and stand up here and say we're going to teach your kids something that we don't want you to be t that we don't want them to be taught. The last, the last, the last I remember, these people got voted into the school board. So that means that parents voted them to be here to get rid of, yeah, you guys, some of you guys. Call to order, just respect the speaker's time, thank you. But yeah, you know. You need to address them, not us. Okay. Yeah, so, you know, as far as, as far as the, the critical race theory and the, um, the uh, the you know the the thing that we're we're working on here with um, you know with with you know creating you know um, enlightening the the school the teachers on a different way of thinking you know I I I agree with it you know I think that um, that uh, you know like like other people were saying here you know um, you know um, this is America and we do we do get a chance to to voice our opinions here and we do have a democratic process that needs to be followed. Um, you know, and, uh, and you know, this is the last frontier here, you know, you guys, you guys got a lot, we got a lot of stuff going on around our country right now, you know, and, and the last I, I heard, you know, our, our education system wasn't doing very well, you know, so why do we even have time to, to teach racism? You know, so, you know, that's, that's all I got. Thank you guys. Thank you, Ms. Motto. Okay, next up we have Mr. Jack Dickinson. Good evening, uh, Superintendent McClay, President Komorowski, and members of the board. Uh, what I just heard might be one of the most disgusting things I have ever heard in my entire life. However, I, I want to talk about your budget and the way you're spending it today. $371,777,172. That's how much money the Temecula Valley Unified School District spends in one year alone. And it's severely mismanaged to begin with. But today, the board and Dr. Kamrowski and Ms. Wiersma and Mr. Gonzalez have proposed hiring an individual named Christopher Allred to teach about critical race theory to the students and, excuse me, to the staff of this school um, and this district, I should say, to clarify. Um, and I'd like to talk about him just briefly. Mr. Allred uh, is an attorney and someone who served on the uh, PSUSD board. I'm sure you're aware of that. And he's been a, quite an advocate of critical race theory and an opponent of such. But I'd like to remind the public that this individual was suspended from the California State Bar for failing to comply with their fine policies for more than 10 years. Is this an individual we want teaching critical race theory? Did you do your research when you went to hire this individual? And if so, did you recall some of his statements? I'd like to read a few of them to you. Quote, the new definition of racism and the concept of systemic racism, systemic racism have been used to justify destroying our country. Furthermore, uh, Mr. Oren said that systemic racism is nothing more than intellectual, intellectual contortion. Is that what you believe? Because you're hiring him. In regards to pride flags and pride in general, he said no other banner or flag, especially a symbol for just one group, should be given a predominant position in our classrooms, especially not over the American flag. Is that what we want in our schools? Should we not recognize groups who have been marginalized for decades? Should we not recognize them? Ms. Wiersma, you specifically, I talked to you many times. Do you want to ignore students? Do you want to put them down? I can't imagine you'd want to do that. And you're shaking your head no, because that's not what you want to do. So why did you hire this person or want to hire this person? It begs the question. I think it's disgusting. And frankly, I think seconds. it's a waste of money. $15,000? Ms. Burdick mentioned teachers. And teachers are paying out of pocket for classroom materials, paying out of pocket to decorate their classrooms. They shouldn't have to do that. 
You should be spending the money that you already misuse on things that we care about, not the disgusting bread that we're served on a daily basis, the underfunded VAPA programs, the frankly overfunded sports programs. Manage your budget properly and stop overspending it on things that are non-issues in this district. Thank you, Jack. Next up, Mr. Chris Lindbergh. Christopher Lindbergh. Chris Lindbergh. Oh, okay. Oh, Chris. Yeah. Chris? Got it right the first time. Good evening. I'd like to speak in favor of several action items that are on the agenda tonight. Uh, specifically the time for special ed teachers, which, which is so necessary, the revised salary schedules for SLPs and career tech teachers, and the increase in counselor staffing. Our counselors have not been able to provide the services that we would want them to provide because of their huge um, amounts of people that they're responsible for. Um, these will all benefit students. I am not in favor of action item number two, costing between fifteen and $30,000 to the district for presentations by someone who is not an educational expert, for someone who was voted off of the school board after serving only two years in Paso Robles, and who admits TVUSD doesn't teach CRT. I'm wondering where your sense of fiscal responsibility is here. This is not a reasonable expense. Where is the transparency in planning the CRT event or these series of presentations for teachers and then the community? Our diverse student body deserves to learn the true history with acknowledgments that life has not been fair to many in America. They need to learn that working for justice for all is the duty of all Americans. Thank you, Mr. Lindbergh. Last speaker, Mr. Christopher Bout. Good evening, President Komrowski, Board of Trustees, Superintendent McClay, staff, and attendees. I prep for two minutes, so I'll have a little bit of breathing room. I might improvise. But uh, tonight's comments are for Trustee Schwartz, primarily. Given the very public exposure of your recent CSBA application, it has become widely known of your contempt for Christians. You asserted that the biggest threat to our schools were Christian nationalists. But let me unpack that a little. Christian is someone who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. No one's going to debate that. And nationalist is someone who vigorously places the interests of their country before any, the interests of any other country. Two admirable attributes, I might argue. However, the phrase is used together, those two words, in gaslighting the public to mask the progressive liberal true agenda, which is to corrupt our children with leftist ideology, including but not limited to CRT, LGBTQ, RST, white guilt, white shaming, support of Black Lives Matter, support of Antifa, support of Democrats or other nefarious groups, who support domestic terror, or angry, purple-haired liberals who twist scripture to fit their narrative. I know you yes, can't answer now, Trustee Schwartz. All of you, please, thank you. Please but I, the speaker. I challenge you, Trustee Schwartz, not right now, I know you can't answer, to make a public declaration clarifying your remark. You don't really hate Christians, do you? You don't really hate patriotism, do you? What do you mean by that? I just want to ask for a clarification. I'm a direct constituent of yours. And that's OK if you don't want to. I don't imagine you will. But if you don't, your silence will only confirm what we already pretty much figured out about you, which is four things. You loathe Christians. You have contempt for what is good and holy. You shamelessly inject your leftist ideology into your governing approach, something you've chastised your colleagues for and are completely unfit to serve on the dais. 30 seconds. Please correct me if I'm wrong. 
All right, I got a few seconds. Um, the CRT, I want to commend Mr. Campos. Uh, is not, I, I support his 1976 project, absolutely. And if, if, everyone, if people are talking about fiscal responsibility, before anyone talks about fiscal responsibility, I challenge them to go to uh, Transparent California and look at Jody McClay's salary of 327000 Thank you, Mr. Bout. Okay. Let's do the consent calendar first and see. Okay, we're on to the consent calendar. All matters listed on the consent calendar are considered routine and all will be en enacted with one vote. There's no discussion of the consent calendar items unless members of the governing board or staff request that specific items be removed from the consent calendar for separate action. I call for a motion a second to approve by consent items one through 26 that were not pulled for a separate action or tabled. Moved. A mo a motion uh, a second. Moved. Yeah, yeah. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. That was second by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion approved 5-0. Is it possible to take a quick break, Dr. Komarski? Absolutely. Let's take five minutes. Ten, minutes. ten, ten minute, ten minute break. Talk about our next steps as well. All right. So let's start with our vision for VAPA, and this is right on our uh, strategic arts plan, which I will talk about again here in just a moment. But our vision for VAPA is this, the Temecula Valley Unified School District promises to provide equal access to a multicultural, diverse, visual and performing arts curriculum for all students in all grade levels. And I wanted to talk to you just briefly about the phrase equal access. That just means we want every student at every grade level to have access to VAPA. And then when we're talking about multicultural diverse, the word diverse is referring to access to all of the disciplines within the arts. So we're talking about dance, music, theater, what am I missing? Visual arts, thank you. So that is our vision, that's where we're headed. Access for everybody to enjoy. All right, our district does have a working strategic arts plan. It was written in 2017 and board, I did link that five-year plan in the slide. So when you get the slide deck, if you haven't had a chance to look at our five-year plan, you can look at it there. It is something that needs to be updated. We're working on an extension right now, so we're going to be updating that, looking at it further into this year. But we are super excited about our vision to expand VAPA. And we have been actively assessing where we have gaps in our current plan and what we can do to fill those. So one of the things that we're doing, the third bullet there is talking about curriculum design teams. Each disciplinary team, so in secondary ed, that would be all of your middle school, high school, instrumental music teachers, instrumental, or I'm sorry, choral music teachers, your dance teachers, each discipline has been meeting with me since the beginning of the year. They get two meetings this spring, and we are really looking at our curriculum and making sure that everything is aligned and also where we have those gaps. So we're working to address that. And one of our biggest dreams is the hope of adding some middle school dance classes for the very first time in our district. That would be amazing. We're also aiming to invest more funding in our co-curricular after school or before school activities and working to maintain our VAPA website and create an ongoing calendar of events where everyone in our community can kind of see what's going on a little bit better. Okay, thank you. All right, our elementary VAPA program, um, amazing elementary school, 
program is very unique because we do offer our elementary students access to all four disciplines of the arts. If you go around the state, you might see music programs, you might see art programs, but very few have access to all disciplines. So we're really, really proud of that. And that we are standards-based and that we have staff that is credentialed in their area of expertise. So it works out really wonderfully. Right now in our current model, each student gets one semester of VAPA and it's delivered in three six-week rotations. So what that means is every student gets three out of the four disciplines each year, and that is why one of our biggest visions and our hopes is to roll that elementary program out further to nine-week rotations for the whole entire year so that kids get all four disciplines. Okay, that's elementary. I hear you clapping out there. <laughs> All right, in our secondary programs, we just wanna keep things going. Our big focus is our vertical pathways, allowing students to continue their VAPA experiences from year to year as they transition to different levels of education. So after they get their amazing elementary VAPA, then fifth graders get introduced to our middle school programs during orientation sessions so that they can see what's available at middle school. And then our incoming freshmen get to go to their feeder high schools and see what's available there. We have developed course catalogs and we are constantly updating them and making sure that they have the most recent up-to-date courses so that our kids can see how many amazing opportunities there are in VAPA electives at the secondary level. And our VAPA teachers have also been collaborating with the counselors at their sites this year to make sure that VAPA t gets some equal branding and, and enthusiasm up for kids to signing up their class. And then of course, in addition to the classes that students take during their school day, we have a lot of students involved in VAPA outside the normal school day, n lots and lots of opportunities. So currently at the mall, there is a Kiwanis art show going on. We have several local artists from our school district who are presented at the mall. And starting next week at the Temecula Valley Museum, the city art show begins. And I just delivered a whole bunch of amazing art projects to go on exhibit at the museum. So that starts next week. And then all around our city, you can see performance groups going on. Um, that, our amazing Great Oak kids just performed in Old Town not too long ago. We have kids performing at Vail Ranch headquarters at the mall. I'm working with some middle school choir teachers on getting some performances at senior living facilities, just all different kinds of things going on. All right, um, we'll go on to the next one. Thank you, Lene. Of course, you guys know we have amazing award-winning VAPA programs as well. So board members this year, you have already recognized the amazing Great Oak Spirit Band and their state championship. Temecula Valley High School is one of only 19 schools in the state to be honored as an exemplary arts education program. And down there in the right-hand corner in our student spotlight, the girls talked about the Chaparral dance program. They sold out all three nights of their spring dance show, which was just amazing. So there's always amazing, amazing things going on in the world of VAPA. So there we go. All right, and at this time, Chris is gonna come up. Thank you. Temecula has always valued and supported the arts, but the state and federal government hasn't always funded it. So we've been creative in our funding to sustain our programs. I'm gonna review ongoing funding and new funding coming. So we use a part of our ESS budget to support the arts at the middle schools under the administration's discretion. We also use co-curricular and extracurricular money which is uh, split between athletics and VAPA and uh, supports the students as seen on the screen, but also allows for three high school performance arts uh, trips um, within a 70 mile radius. Principals again manage those funds. The way we're able to support the elementary program is from LCAP funding. Our district was very creative in supporting that and that was how we were able to develop that. Um, and there's also ESSER three funds, which we use, and you can see the amounts that each school gets. It's not a lot. So now, um, 
and the November election, Prop 28, passed. And it's exciting news for VAPA, because there's finally designated funds just for the arts, which ongoing funds. Yes, everyone, that is important. Beginning this year, we, every year, ongoing forever, will get at least 3.2 million annually, or 1% of whatever our budget is as a district that is specifically for the arts. Now, there are restrictions within that. 80% is for personnel. That does not mean we can move it over to pay for our established staff. That's supplanting. Its intent is to grow the arts throughout the state. So 80% of that needs to be for hiring staff to grow our programs. 19% can be for materials and trainings, and then 1% for administrative needs. There's also information out there about the Arts, Music, and Instructional Materials Block Grant. It was originally proposed that we would get $16 million, but as the governor reviews the budget, we still don't know what that number is going to be. We already know there's a cut. And although it has Art, Music, and Instructional in the um, title, it is an open-ended grant, so we're waiting to see what that number is going to be and how it will impact our different programs. It is definitely an exciting time, though, to be in the arts. Chris, did you want to talk about the curriculum resources real quick? I thought I was just the money guy. I'm also the technology guy. <laughs> so my role is instructional technology, and over uh, the past few years, we're finding that programs also support our students in their music development mostly, and these are some of the programs our teachers are using. We actually have had one of our TV uh, HS students write their own symphony using GarageBand, which the entire orchestra performed and said it was the hardest performance of their career. So it's exciting to see what students are able to do with technology that I personally cannot. Here, here. I, I'm right there with you. Okay, I put a little video together so you can kind of see some of the kids in action in, in VAPA, so we'll watch that real quick. Isn't it fun to see the progression from elementary all the way up to high school? It's wonderful. All right, so where are we headed next? Um, moving forward, we are currently in the process of course selection for next fall. Kids are signing up, so we are continuing our work with all of that. We are evaluating our current strategic arts plan, and we will be working to update that, continue the growth of our program. 
And then in my role as Vapitosa, I have this amazing opportunity to network and collaborate with people all across our city, county, and state um, who are strong proponents of the arts for our students. They are fellow educators, they are artists in the community, and as our our program continues to grow. We want to deepen those relationships and continue giving our students experiences that show how they can be artists, not only now, but throughout their school years and then beyond school as thriving members of their community. Tax-paying citizens, what was that? Um, <laughs> and then lastly, in closing, go ahead there, Lene, thank you. I would just would like to reiterate that we can never underestimate the value of arts education for our students. Whenever we're talking about what's best for kids, and we talk about that a lot in this district, VAPA is, in my non-biased opinion, one of the most important pieces because it reaches kids in places that other curricular areas just can't. There is a sense of safety and belonging, a freedom to create and share, and an overall sense of well-being there. We literally have kids who tell us all the time, you are my favorite thing of the week. You are the reason I get out of bed and come to school. It just makes a huge difference in their lives. So thank you so much for your ongoing support to make that happen. And we will try to entertain some questions if you have any questions. Just a quick comment. <clears throat> Thank you so much for that presentation. It was very enlightening, and I think you're all doing fantastic work, and it's so great to see some um, additional increased funds going to VAPA. Like you said, I think it's the reason that some kids get out of bed in the morning and come to school, and it's critical um, to our district. So thank you both for all the hard work you're doing. Uh, yeah, we had the pleasure of meeting at Great Oak when they did the uh, drumline presentation, yes. and we saw the all the things that the um, different groups do there. There were probably 500 parents in the audience, frantic and happy and thrilled to see what their children are doing. Uh, President Komrowski was there with me. It was just absolutely amazing, and we thank you for what you do and for keeping our kids involved. I can truly say it is my pleasure. <laughs> Speaking of drumline, I was going to mention this um, at the end, but I know that they're doing a fundraiser, and I just wanted to thank the folks for sending that to me. Just the fact that you are trying to raise money, that, um, that you're back on the national stage for the second time in 19-year school history. I was so impressed. Thank you for what you do. I hope that people will check that out. I love the fact that the community can contribute. And then with these extra funds that come in, where do you see most readily applying that? What would you, what, what would be your dream? We're still talking through with the committee where we want to go, but we want an aligned curriculum that when we're getting students excited about dance in the elementary school, we want to build the middle school dance programs where there are none and building like that um, pathways for each domain. Yeah. Thank you for bringing the joy. I grew up as a dancer, gymnast, <laughs> love it. It's important. It's important. Yeah, I, did want, I wanted to thank you and echo what Steve said. My mind was blown when I got to go to the event at Great Oak. And like I said, uh, my um, board comments, Ashley on the French horn has my heart forever. <laughs> it was so awesome to hear her in the backdrop solo. of that band. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. And I'm really stoked um, that uh, you have this new funding. I love art. Thank you. It's good to hear. It's been a long time coming. And compliment to her. This is her first board presentation. Did a wonderful job. <laughs> she seemed like a pro. Well done. Okay, next up we have Nicole Ash that's going to present action item one, a second interim financial report slash Let's see if I can get that to work. It's not fair that I have to follow up VAPA with the budget, but uh, <laughs> no cute kids in my presentation, unfortunately. So it feels like we were just here, and that's because we were. Uh, first interim is presented every December, and then second interim always comes in March. And so um, we'll talk about what's changed in the last three months, give you an update, and look at those multi-year projections. So kind of a lot of numbers on a, piece, on a page here, but if you look at that change column, 
That's what's changed from first interim to second interim. And the big number that sticks out is the federal revenue going down by $4 million. Don't be alarmed. We're not actually receiving $4 million less in federal revenue, but the way that federal revenue gets reported is you don't get to report it until you spend it. And so there are multiple projects that we thought we were going to get done this year that won't be done until next year, such as HVAC upgrades and window coverings. Those are getting pushed off into July, August uh, time period, which is next fiscal year. Therefore, it's coming out this year, but that revenue will show back up next year um, when we spend the dollars. Other state um, revenue is just going down slightly for that same exact reason. Some of the expenditures that we had budgeted this year won't happen until ne next year. And because they're deferred revenue, we don't report them until we spend them. Good news, well, a little bit of good news. Local revenue is up, but the majority of that 2.8 million in local revenue is reporting of facility dollars that we used to report in Fund 40. We are now going to report in Fund 1 because if you'll recall, um, we are going to fund Phase 3 of the Summit Academy construction. We're going to borrow money from our general fund and pay ourselves back rather than issuing debt at a high interest rate. And so uh, revenue that we used to report in another fund, we were, are now going to report in the general fund. So that's what that 2.8 million is. Not new money, it's just money that be, is being reported here now instead of another fund. Expenditures, we're just catching up on um, where we're actually going to end the year. So salaries are coming down due to vacancies that in some cases we're having to um, fill with contracted services for those hard to fill positions. So you'll notice contracted services is going up a bit. Um, and the, the majority of services, you can see uh, $2.7 million almost, the increase in expenditures for services, that's the implementation of ELOP, our Expanded Learning Opportunity Program. We received a significant amount of money this year that is ongoing, and we're, uh, we're expanding our services to intercession. So spring break, summer, we're going to be expanding those ELOP programs to various school sites, and so we're just reporting the expenditures in, for Think Together, um, which is the vendor that we will be utilizing. Non-public school costs have gone up also, as well as utilities. So the big number there that has increased is that services and other operating for that reason. We talked about federal and state revenue coming down because projects will be done next year. That capital outlay is that offset. So those capital outlay projects, the expenditures, and the revenue you'll be seeing next year. So that's the changes from first interim to second interim, or from December to March. And now looking at the three-year, multi-year projections, you can see just starting off up at the top, LCFF revenues will continue to go up based on funded COLAs. Federal revenue will come down to that $9 million number. That's normal. Normally, we receive about $9 million a year in federal revenue. The reason for the high numbers this year and next year is the one-time funds, that ESSER 3, the um, E-log, things like that that we report as we spend down. So this year and next year are higher than normal. Other state revenue, we receive, we reported that um, learning recovery block grant, 17.8 million, and I know Mr. Dixon just referenced the arts, music, and instructional material block grant, 16.2 million. That's why other state revenue is significantly higher this year than it is in the two out years, is those two block grants. But um, as he also mentioned, we've already heard from the governor's office that he is planning on covering the state deficit by reducing that arts, music, and instructional materials block grant by one third. Even since that uh, occurred, state revenues have not come in um, in line with his projections, so we anticipate more cuts will come. Where they come is yet to be seen. And local revenue is anticipated to remain flat. Salaries and supplies will continue to grow as uh, step and column increases, and then PERS and STRS rates continue to increase. You can see those rates there. Capital outlay, you can see that $25 million number next year. That is the cost of phase three of the TK-8. But keep in mind, general fund is going to front the money and facility dollars are going to pay that loan back. If you look at the ending fund balance down at the bottom, the $137.7 million 
134.1 and 130.8 or 0.9. Those numbers are on the next slide of the breakdown of those numbers. So uh, while we do have significantly high ending fund balance, the question is always, well, how much of that is unrestricted or how much of that is our true savings account? So to, because if you look uh, on the way down, like for example, restricted balances are 50, 3 million this year, they go up next year, and then as we spend down those one-time dollars, ending fund balance in restricted goes down to the 43 million. So to answer the question, how much do we have in our rainy day funds or our savings account? The two arrows are pointing to the two numbers that make up our true unrestricted general fund balance. And to do the quick math for you, for this year we're anticipating almost 60 million in unrestricted general fund dollars. Next year, that drops to 41.9. That's because we're funding that phase three of the TK-8. And then 24, 25, it, it will stay around that $42 million number as we as um, facility dollars come, come in, they will slowly pay back that loan over time. Okay, so what is included in the budget? I gave you the uh, assumed ADA and COLA for um, the next three years. We also included, as I mentioned, the Learning Reco Recovery Block Grant and the Arts, Music, and Instructional Materials Block Grant. But as I mentioned, the governor has already stated that there will be cuts made to the one-time dollars. Um, as long as those cuts stay to the one-time dollars, I think will be great. It will be more detrimental if he starts cutting ongoing projected revenue. Um, there is an increase in the special ed uh, funding base, which is great news. And then just as a reminder, this board has taken action and made commitments, number one, to set aside 6% reserve for economic uncertainties. By law, that has to be 3%, but to be fiscally responsible, the board made a commitment to make that 6%. Um, we, the board has also dedicated 1% of overall expenditures to deferred maintenance. We know that facilities, maintaining them in good repair is a uh, priority. And then lastly, the board has also made a commitment to maintain that one-to-one -one device um, district-wide. So all of those things are included in the budget. What is not included in the budget, so how staffing or budget works when we build next year's budget, we literally sit down with every single school site Every single department, uh, we've actually sat down with VAPA already, we talk with counselors, we talk programs district-wide individually, and we actually staff every budget, every single position, every single student. And so we are in the middle of doing that right now, and so any changes in staffing that come out of those conversations have not been included in next year's budget quite yet. This is just what we knew as of um, going into this month. We did not budget expenditures for those block grants because we don't want to set a plan until we know those numbers are solidified and they are um, for sure going to happen. As I mentioned, the proposed reduction already is 5.8 million. We don't know um, if that will change or not. The Prop 28 funding, the VAPA funding that um, was just mentioned, we have not budgeted that yet also. Um, that will be coming in the adopted budget. It's approximately 3.6 million. It is broken down by school site. We uh, can file a waiver to pool the funds together to maximize those dollars. Um, and then lastly, and this is very common, I just wanna remind the board, we are settled for compensation this year, but we've made no assumptions or budgeted any dollars for compensation moving forward. And that's typical, but I just wanna remind the board that budget compensation adjustments are not assumed in the budget, okay? And uh, so be on the lookout. The next time we'll hear from the governor is at the May revision. Um, that will be, it's usually about the third week of May. We'll see how those cuts um, look moving forward. We have expanded the window for transitional kindergarten. So starting as of this year, you have to have turned five by February 2nd. Next year, you have to turn five by June 2nd to qualify for TK. So that's expanding that window pretty significantly. We'll see how that adjusts our enrollment and therefore adjusts staffing. That will be in the adopted budget. Summit Academy enrollment um, is yet to be seen, but I'm, I have high hopes that we will fill that school and then some. And then lastly, attendance rates have not quite fully recovered from the pandemic. So we're hopeful that in the out years, those attendance rates come back up to that 95 and a half percent 
rate that we experience pre-pandemic, we tend to have very great attendance rates, but that has a direct impact on our funding. So before I take questions, I'd just like to do a quick introduction. My director of fiscal services, Courtney Fingerlin, is here, as well as the assistant director, um, Sheila Brown. Sorry, I had a moment. Um, and I, I introduced Courtney the last time I presented the first interim budget. She uh, has attended middle, elementary, middle school, and high school in TVUSD. Now she uh, has come full circle as the director of fiscal services, and now she is breaking my heart and leaving TVUSD to move out of state to be with family. So I just want to thank her for her incredible um, service to this district, and I'm heartbroken, and I'm going to need a hug the next time you see me because I won't have her. So with that, we will take any questions that you may have. I've got a couple. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> so the block grant funding that you mentioned, so you said it, we do have the income but not the expense in the budget. Do those expenses have to be spent in one year? Can it be spread out? Are there restrictions on how those are going to be spent or is yep. that still Let me go back to the slide that shows you the dollar amount. So the 17.8 uh, in the learning recovery block grant, that one is restricted. There are very specific uses on what's allowable, and that you have a five-year window, so they have to be spent by June of 2028. The 16.2 million that's been proposed to be cut by one-third, that has to be spent by June 30th, 2026, and that is unrestricted, essentially. Okay. Awesome, that's great. Um, so when we looked at, sorry, back, if you could go back like, um, one more, yes, right there. So um, when we see kind of the reduction in the projected budgets, is that primarily in one-time funding? Do you feel like that's where most of the reductions are coming? For revenue yes. or expenditures? Revenue. For revenue, that is one-time money falling off. So okay. yes, um, re federal revenue specifically and other state revenue, those are reducing because that one-time money is going away. Right, okay, great. And my last question is, um, on a scale of one to 10, <laughs> How do you feel about 41.9 million in a rainy day fund? Because I know that sounds like a lot of money. However, when you look that our budget is 400 million, do you feel like that's sufficient or do you feel like that's something we need to try to put more into that rainy day fund for future years? Because we can see there are little reductions each year and I understand a lot of that's one-time funding, but I feel like at some point we're gonna kinda hit that. So I do, I will always say that I will not apologize for our ending fund balance um, because payroll in a single month could wipe out our entire unrestricted general fund. And when the economy takes a dip, we always turn to that ending fund balance to make sure that we don't have to make knee jerk cuts in order to um, prepare a balanced budget. That being, so I, I feel like it is sufficient. It's wonderful that we have the robust um, ending fund balance that we do. And I would happily, in, well in phase three of the Summit Academy is kind of eating up some of that um, unrestricted general fund dollars. But I'm always happy to entertain conversations of what we needs the district has that are one time that we could marry with those one time dollars um, because is it, would it be detrimental to reduce that a little bit? Absolutely not. But what we can't do is um, add ongoing costs to one-time revenue. That's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. And so um, we talked uh, at length a, a few months back about maybe committing some of those funds for capital improvements. I personally have a bit of a hard time putting um, general fund dollars to facility projects. Um, I, I really feel like we could do some one-time things, but maybe not facility projects, maybe things that are instructional materials and supplies-ish. Um, you know, band instruments are incredibly expensive, or what are those types of things that are more one-time in nature, um, but more uh, short-term rather than capital improvement. So right. I would, and those are the type of conversations we have with each department and each program of, okay, let's talk ongoing needs, but let's also talk one-time, and I know I've, 
ask um, Mrs. Lazowski for a list of what are those bands and instruments that we haven't been able to afford? What are those things, um, you know? And so we've been having those conversations for sure. Okay, awesome. Well, and once again, thank you so much for all your hard work, you and your whole department. I know this is a ton of work and you are always so well-versed and can answer my questions right off the cuff, so appreciate you. I would love to know a little bit more about the TK projection. I just went to French Valley Elementary the other day and heard some things, so how do you see that impacting us? I know you touched on it, but was just curious. It sounded like a robust plan. So you mean for the transitional kindergarten window? Mm -hmm. So we've been telling every single elementary school be prepared to open one more TK class in case um, the whites of their eyes show up. TK is incredibly hard to um, predict, right? So we've taken a couple different approaches. We said we took all of our kindergartners this year and we said how many of them were born from February 2nd to June 2nd? And that put us at like adding 19 new TK classes if that was any indication. Then we said, well, we're expanding the window 30%. What does that look like if we expanded TK by 30%? And that was like 11 classes. But then we looked at birth rates um, from a while back and it's like maybe we're only adding three classes <laughs> because birth rates continue to go down. And as, um, and I, I've said this in um, presentations in the past, we are not growing in enrollment, we're declining. We are no longer the first time home buyer community that we used to be. Um, and it's harder and harder for first time home buyers and young families to afford to live in Temecula. And so the, the folks that move in don't tend to have little ones anymore as much as they used to. So we're kind of grappling with that. So we have a plan. We're um, going to have the furniture ready to go. We're gonna have the classroom space ready to go, but we are not gonna pull the trigger until we actually see those enrollment com numbers come in. Um, but like I said, at, we've told every elementary school to plan on opening one. And if they show up, that would be great because we would, it would also mean additional funding. And that's not even to talk about the incredible uh, data that there is around when you can get students in at four years old versus five years old. The data really supports their success. So that's what we're really hoping for is to get them in early and we're trying to advertise as much as possible. But we are right now building the staffing model and the enrollment model and we're just kind of waiting to see who comes. I have a quick question, forgive me if I miss this. Um, Pre-pandemic enrollment was 95%, what is it now? Oh, attendance was 95.5. It's dipped to about 94% this year. It was about 92 and a half last year, so we've made progress, but not all the way. Perfect, thank you. Okay, okay. any other, any other comments? Okay, so I'd like to call for a motion and a second to approve two things, a positive certification. Oh, and thank you, Ms. Slash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, a positive certification for the second interim financial report of the Temecula Valley Unified School District for the 2022-23 fiscal year and two subsequent fiscal years, and then B, Revisions to the operating budget as outlined in the second interim financial report. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. Um, all in favor, say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. And I believe we have public comments for the next one. The consultant agreement, Aaron Law Firm, item two. We have four public comments so we can do do three minutes each. And first up, um, Jenny Scharf. It's Jenny Scharf.
Jared, thank you, during a one-sided lecture. I assume you could all hear my teacher voice, though. Um, it is clear that you came into this district with preconceived notions, none of which have borne out, as you have never mentioned seeing them in your school's site visits. In fact, all you do is laud the schools. And instead of dealing with actualities, you are wasting money, time, and effort on a phantom problem of your own making. This is an egregious abuse of power. Now let's get to that ridiculous expense of these indoctrination sessions. 15K for a self-proclaimed expert who studied C CRT through the lens of his own bias, really? Why not an actual professor of CRT? And then there's the subs. Where are they going to come from? I could barely even get a sub today when I took B BSU on, on a field trip. How much will that cost the district? Another 15 to 25K is what's estimated. Do you know how many textbooks or calculators or desks or boxes of tissues or lab equipment or field trips or student activities that money could buy? Or how many hours of essay grading you could actually pay me for? I do, the students do, and we will make sure the parents, the voters do as well. And so you voted to pass a resolution that you don't even understand enough that you all could explain it to us. You've created division and sown discord over a non-issue that you can't even explain to the people you are imposing it on or the taxpayers who are footing the bill. Spending money to simply explain yourselves is outrageous. Let's not forget about the community indoctrination forum. I'm sure Ms. Wiersma is exceptionally proud that people who look different are included, yet there, once again, is no diversity of thought. Each and every panelist shares your view. All of these extremist right-wing groups like seconds. to call teachers and groomers indoctrinators. However, the only indoctrination is coming literally at the expense of our students. The irony is not lost on me or them, but it seems to be lost on you. Please vote against these unnecessary, expensive, and wasteful events. And one last thing, Jody, I want to thank you for keeping this district above average at your average salary. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have Leslie Demedensis. Thank you for the phonetic. Did I get it right? Yeah, you did. Thank you. Um, hello, my name is Leslie Demetisis, and I'm here to speak about item two on today's action items. I've lived in Temecula for 16 years, and I have three children in three different TVUSD schools. Makes pickup really fun in the afternoon. My husband and I chose to live in Temecula specifically because of the school district. I'm in Mr. Gonzalez's trustee area, and this may not surprise you, but I didn't vote for you. However, I had really hoped that you would represent all members of your trustee area, especially after your vote during the emergency meeting held in January. You showed that you can be more than just a follower. Instead, you've joined the other two new board members in a show of Christian nationalism, AKA white supremacy, that is working hard at erasing any critical thought and any individuals who don't match your idea of what a good Christian looks like under the guise of protecting the children. In fact, at the last board meeting, your puppet master sat front and center right over here to make sure he still held your strings. Um, which after make the vote on spending money on unnecessary legal counsel, it is clear he does. Back to item two, the consultant agreement with Aaron Law Firm. The individual you have requested to speak to our teachers for a fee of $15,000 has no background in education, no expertise in CRT, or any factual data to back up his rhetoric. If you wanna have a training with teachers about CRT, why not use a university professor who actually teaches the subject and can better explain the theory? Bring in professors from the education department at CSUSN and have them address the topic in a meaningful way. Why does the board keep wanting to hire people from Paso Robles who clearly have a political agenda without proper vetting procedures? There should be a selection committee with a number of individuals to choose from. There is so much concern about teachers indoctrinating students. What about your speakers indoctrinating the teachers with their lies and ignorance? This is all the expense of our students. The money that this individual would cost our district, both in terms of his payment and sub costs, could be partly used to increase sub pay so we can retain quality subs, provide actual unbiased and useful professional development to staff members, increase supply budget so teachers don't have to constantly pay for things out of pocket, give our classified employees more support, fund bands and drum lines so they don't have to fundraise quite so much. The money that the new board members seem to be so willing to spend on their racist and homophobic agendas is not theirs. This money belongs to our schools and students. Stop using our district's money to perpetuate your hateful racist or, and fascist agenda. On a seconds. side note, 
TVOSG staff members have been um, being verbally assaulted as recently as this past weekend by individuals stating that teachers need to support the new board's ways. Security was called at Walmart just this past weekend because of this. This is what is spreading thanks to the resolutions and wasteful spending of our new board members. You're spreading hate and division in our city. Thank you. Thank you. We have Mrs. Audrey Aikenbach. Audrey Aikenbach. Audrey Aikenbach, was the mic on? I thought it was. Okay, maybe she's not here. We'll get her on the next one then if she shows up. We have uh, next speaker, Jean Femia. Good evening. I, um, a lot of the things that I was going to say have already been said, but I'll say them again. Uh, I'm concerned about hiring this consultant for the teacher groups at the rate of $15,000, which seems excessive, particularly because this gentleman um, does not have experience in the classroom, does not have curriculum experience uh, with the school district. Uh, he is an attorney, and he wrote the resolution, which you all copied and then uh, passed here. Um, but since he's not a teacher uh, or has any curriculum experience, I don't understand what practical value it could be to have him coming and talking to, to our teachers. Uh, I understand that these focus groups have already been promoted to teachers, uh, and I know that the, that the panel for the community has been promoted because I've seen that myself, but um, it hasn't been discussed or, or voted for by the board, and you guys have not voted yet to hire the, the gentleman that you promised, Mr. Aaron. I'm particularly disappointed in what you've done here because you've blown a great opportunity. In December, you passed this resolution, which, which you didn't run by parents or teachers or students or community members or the school district staff or the school district attorneys. You just, you just passed it. I think you were surprised at the amount of uh, opposition that you received. And I was hoping that these focus groups and community um, outreach would occur n not to convince everybody that you guys were right in the first place, but instead to get actual people's opinions and to see if there's a way that you could alter this resolution so that it makes more sense for everyone. I spoke against the resolution uh, in December, and it wasn't because I have pre preconceived notions about CRT. It was because I read the resolution. I've spent the last 30 years as a technical writer. That's how I earn my living. I read, and I understand technical things that I write. And what I discovered there was that there were specific forbidden ideas. And if I were a teacher, or if seconds. I were a student in the classroom, those specific ideas would be things that I would want to cover and that I would want to know about. So I strongly urge you not to um, hire these people to come and talk. I urge you to instead have real focus groups and get real input from the community and amend your resolution. Thank you very much. Thank you. I know that we have the option of bringing um, Mr. Aaron in on a phone call to answer questions, and I'm assuming we'll have discussion. So I would start off on the other end and open it up. Can we go ahead and bring him in, or do we want to? I, I do have some questions. Thanks, Lene. Yeah. You tell me. I don't care. But if you want to ask me questions. Paying him phone money? Hello? Hello? Mr. Mr. Aaron, we're bringing you in. Uh, we're on the action item right now. You are live at the school board meeting in Meglo. I am going to start. 
Um, Dr. K. So I'm going to start. I'm just going to read the statement that I prepared. All right, Mr. Gonzalez is going to start. Thank you for joining us, Mr. Aaron. Uh, so sure. I'm just I'm just going to read a statement that I already kind of had prepared. There was I was going to go off script and just address some of the. I, I, mute him. I can't hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, um, you can't hear Mr. Gonzalez speak. No, I, I, I couldn't hear him. Yeah, well, no, he can't even hear you, though, so I'm trying to figure out. Speak right now. Yeah, speak in your mic. Um, okay, how do you mute this? <clears throat> Just give us a second. Okay. <coughs> I'm, I'm not speaking to him. I'm just... That, that's okay. I'm not, I'm not asking him any questions right now. If I could just read it. Um, all right, so let, let me just read what I had prepared already, um, the things that I wanted to discuss on this after going through uh, kind of numerous emails on this topic. Um, I want to clarify, um, first and foremost, the intention of uh, my suggestion to bring uh, Christopher Aaron in to consult um, with our teachers, um, specifically about the resolution and how that affects us here in Temecula. This is not... Um, and an and attempt to have a broader discussion on the merits of critical race theory. That has not been any of the communication that I've had with staff, with, with uh, parents. I, I'm not getting emails from a bunch of people that are promoting critical race theory. I think that we all agree that it's not appropriate for K through 12 education. And what we need to do at this point is we need to go through the resolution line by line and we need to do some explanation on how that affects the teachers here. And then we need to open it up for some feedback from our teachers. And I've been working on that for the last two months. Um, I've, I've, I've um, enlisted the help of many in our district staff, our ESS department. I've partnered with Ms. Barclay um, on portions of this to try and push this forward. So, um, <clears throat> I wanna start by reading um, from the first line here, and this is something that I, I put together yesterday. Um, after the December meeting um, where the board adopted a policy banning the teaching of CRT, uh, I became aware of a few things. The first was that the approach had the perception of being very heavy handed. I believe we missed an opportunity to engage with our teachers and the public on this ahead of passing the resolution, and I see a need to do that work now. The resolution had the unintended consequence of causing confusion with our staff because it was not immediately clear how this would affect the teaching of certain curriculums or this would affect AP and IB courses that encourage critical thinking. I've been listening to all of you and engaged with many in this community, especially those who disagreed with my decision to support this resolution. I began working with our district administration over two months ago to facilitate these conversations and it was my understanding that I am not an expert on critical race theory. I come from the perspective of a concerned parent I've done my own independent research on the topic over the past four to five years, and I have concerns about this ideology like many parents in our community, regardless of party affiliation. With the input from our ESS department and Dr. McClay, I suggested that we enlist the help of Mr. Arend, as I had many conversations with, excuse me, I had many conversations with him about this topic. It is my understanding that Mr. Aaron drafted the resolution that was utilized by my colleague, Dr. Kamrowski, in the drafting of the resolution here in Temecula. What I am asking the board to approve is focused on our resolution and not a broader discussion about the merits of CRT. Most educators and community members that I have engaged with agree that CRT is not appropriate for K-12 education. We need to clarify this resolution, and Mr. Aaron is an expert and can walk our staff through the resolution line by line, inviting conversation and questions to highlight how this resolution is intended to work. After his presentation, we have set up breakout sessions with our ESS team and curriculum experts 
to go through our teaching materials and to bring up any additional questions or concerns. This information is needed so that we can address these concerns. I've asked Ms. Barclay to join me in this, and she has been supportive of my motivations despite having valid concerns, and I appreciate her being willing to work with me through this process. These focus groups are vital to our district, and if we find areas of concern that need to be amended in the language of our resolution, I am committed to bringing those to this board in a partnership with my colleagues that were for and against this resolution and the direction of our district administration staff. I urge you not to jump to conclusions on this contract and support me in collecting this much needed feedback so we can start to heal this community and put an end to the confusion on this topic. Well, I'll go next. Um, <laughs> Can you guys keep the chatter up down out there and let Mrs. Barclay speak? Thank you. It's fine. It'll smoke properly. Um, I have thought a lot about this meeting tonight, and Mr. Gonzalez and I have had many, many conversations about <clears throat> this resolution and about what we think needs to happen next. And I will agree with your point that um, I do believe we have the same motivations that you have conveyed to me, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn by saying this, but stop me if I am, um, that you agree that maybe it was done a little backwards, that it would have been much better to have conversations before the resolution came. Um, that didn't happen, um, and here we are today. And I do agree that we need to have focus groups to hear from the teachers. My issue, and you know this, we have talked about it, I'm not surprising you here, um, is that I don't know that I can agree that Mr. Aaron is the best person to do that. And I understand your point of view that he has put together the resolution. And if I felt confident that what was going to happen was a simple walkthrough and discussion line by line, I might have a different opinion. But I have done some research. I have watched a video. I was hoping to speak with him, but unfortunately, um, Mrs. Wiersma reached out to him, um, unbeknownst to us, because we were putting this together, and because you reached out to him, I did not think it was appropriate for me to talk to him because once again, I don't feel that, I mean, there could be a risk um, of a violation of three of us speaking to someone who has a contract coming forward. So unfortunately, I was not able to speak to him, which is one reason why he is here tonight on the phone um, so that we can ask him some questions um, because I do have some questions. Um, and I have heard a lot from the community. I will say in my, how long have I been on the board? A year and a little more than a year. This, I've gotten the most emails on this issue right here. Um, and I do appreciate that because what it tells me is that people care and people are paying attention, which is what we need in this district. More of, all of us. I can admit before I was on the school board, um, I was an involved parent, but I could have done better. And um, I encourage everyone to continue to, you know, be involved in your community because it's important, as we can all see. And I appreciate all of you sticking out this meeting tonight. Um, and most of the concerns that I that I have seen come to me are in his qualifications. Um, you're, you're correct. He did was the original author of this. Um, he has done his own research, but. Um, it's very difficult to have someone who is not an educator come to try to educate educators. Um, it's a hard sell. It's a really hard sell. Um, and in watching his video today, um, I did have additional questions um, that I would love to address. So are, can you hear me, Mr. Aaron? Are you still on the phone? Is he yes, me? Yes, okay. I can hear you. Okay, fantastic. Um, so a couple of questions. So I did observe your rate in your contract, but I did listen to um, an interview that was done with you back in May of 2022, where you said you'd be happy to come and speak to groups for gas money. 
And, and honestly, you probably remember this, you did kind of um, um, speak negatively of those who were charging large amounts to service consultants to districts to speak on the subject of racism, but I almost feel like now we're doing the, op you know, you're doing the opposite thing. So can you speak to your rate um, that you're charging us for this? Okay. Sure, sure. The rate is, you've got to realize I'm, the plan is that I will have uh, six hours of lecturing on two consecutive days that in, the rate covers all the preparation time and I've put quite a lot of time into uh, uh, drafting the uh, PowerPoint presentation, adapting what I did for much shorter uh, events uh, a few months ago uh, when this topic was not quite as heated as it is now. Uh, but th there's a lot of time that goes into this. These rates are uh, very fair compensation for this. Now, they are not nearly as extreme as some of the rates, for instance, charged by uh, Mr. Kendi, who charges $30,000 for uh, a one-hour Zoom meeting. Uh, so I, <laughs> but now maybe I'd long to consider that rate a little bit high, but uh, I think my rates are very reasonable compared to that. And the amount of work that I'm putting into this, taking uh, the days off to come down there and really work with people. You know, this, this topic of critical race theory, one of the things that I have Actually, noticed is- can I just stop you right everybody there? Everybody for or against it. Mr. Aaron. Not many people know what it is. Right, um, just to stop you right there, because you did answer my question. I'm not sure who Mr. Kendi is and I, Definitely would not support thirty thousand for one hours. One hours he's worth one of, of the work. leading authors on critical race theory. Fantastic, um, but yeah, he's not. He's not on our on our list today. Um, so so also, Mr. Ann. So so I think we all agree that CRT is not taught in our district. It's definitely much too complex of a subject, really for for our students, and really too complex of a subject to delve into in an hour and a half with teachers, I would also guess, since it is, um, you know, I'm assuming uh, much, much more hours at a high level of college to understand it. Um, but you consider, um, from what I've read, that similar frameworks um, would be things like the definition of racism, systemic racism, um, or the existence of certain classes throughout a history defined as oppressed and oppressor. It, is that correct, what you consider, those are, that's what you consider to be similar frameworks well, that you What quote? I will be discussing is the philosophical uh, foundations of critical race theory. And you notice it's not called critical race thinking, it's called critical race theory. There's sure. a big difference between critical theory and critical thinking. Uh, and critical theory is pretty easily defined uh, philosophical line goes back to uh, Hegel and so on. I don't want to get into all this right. stuff now uh, for everybody that's here. But uh, the lectures are to first give an understanding of the philosophical foundations of critical race theory, then do a definitional analysis because the definitions, especially the key definition of racism is uh, there are two definitions and it's extremely important to distinguish between the two definitions. Uh, and then uh, look through the basic tenets of critical race theory and then go into some of the effects. And then once that understanding is there, and I'm sure I can communicate that understanding uh, to the staff and the units we have designed, uh, then to go through the resolution and basically line by line and show how, how that thing works, how that document works. It's a little bit longer than the document we did in Paso Robles, but uh, uh, line by line through there. And I think you will find that it, uh, by the end of it, everybody will have a better, much better understanding of what critical race theory is. They may not agree with me. I didn't expect anyone to agree with me, of course. But uh, at least I hope to promote some more, you know, some civil discourse where people understand what they're talking about. Okay, so I mean, I guess, I guess one of my issues is that, as as Mr. Gonzalez and I discussed. It was not my understanding that we were going to be, quote unquote, teaching about critical race theory because in reviewing your PowerPoint, the majority is discussing critical race theory and your definitions of racism 
and systemic racism and things like that, I don't, I would not consider those to be um, definitions that are, that can be agreed upon by everyone. So that's where, what's that? That's what I say is you have to understand, just talking about the definition Yes, but just because you say it's a definition doesn't mean it is. You have to know the difference between the new definition and the old definition to start understanding what some of these concepts are that are in the uh, resolution. Well, as defined by who? As defined by who? I think that's what the difficulty is. So, so, and one is the old uh, Webster's definition, and the new definition goes back to about 1970, and it uh, has been incorporated as an additional definition, or it's planned on being incorporated as an additional definition of racism in uh, uh, the Merriam-Webster, I believe it is. But the two definitions are fundamentally different, and they lead to fundamentally different uh, logical consequences when you start doing an analysis of the doctrine of critical race theory. Certainly, but they also go to um, the understanding of um, of our culture and our and where we have come as a society. And so that's where I have difficulty that you will be telling our teachers this is the definition of racism when that is not a widely or widely accepted definition. So this is where I get into into issues because there certainly are other theories taught in school. I'm not speaking of critical race theory. But these ideas of that are similar to, I'm not saying similar, but um, theories of what is racism, theories of systemic racism. We study um, the theory of gravity. That's a theory. It's not a fact. We study the theory of evolution. There's many parents who, in their own home, this is not something that they teach. However, children go to school, they learn, they're exposed to many different ideas, and they come home and have that parental reinforcement. So this is where I take issue with um, coming into teachers and presenting to them the way that your PowerPoint is and the things that you said in your video, mocking concepts, these concepts that some of us actually really believe in. The more I study systemic racism, it has answered a lot of questions that I've had over my lifetime um, growing up in the South, moving to the West, why are things the way they are? A lot of it really makes a lot of sense to me as I study it more and more. And, and in your video where you talk, call them trash, garbage, and ridiculous, and a scam, you know, I think that is an issue for our teachers and our community to hear that things that we hold to be true, you call trash and garbage. So I think that's. I, I think you'll find, first of all, the, 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 when I'm speaking to audiences that are a bit contentious in one direction, uh, I, and well, it's having a little bit of fun with them, uh, sure, some of the language uh, will be like that. The uh, events that are going to be planned, that are planned here for uh, your district, if you all approve the resolution will be a, a fairly academic exercise. Uh, we're going to be going through, as I say, the philosophical foundations, the definitional analysis. And yes, I will be using the definitional analysis. I've used uh, that some of the legal skills that I've acquired in this country and especially in Germany. I hear what you're saying. However, teachers have done their research and they have watched the video. So having someone come in to speak to them, whether or not you use the word trash or garbage in your presentation, I think they are already predisposed to an opinion, knowing where your opinion lies. So this is where I have, I do have an issue. And I think that, um, you know, in the video, you talk about people who come in and talk about these other subjects, such as systemic racism, um, that what they're trying to do is sell division and hate to make money. Um, I might argue that you're doing the same on the opposite end. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Barsley. Uh, we'll go on to Mr. Schwartz next. Uh, Could you I'm shut that off, please? Got, uh, such a negative attitude about it. I would hope that this resolution is true. Uh, you will be one of the individuals attending this session. No, we won't. The board members are not invited. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, actually, quite, quite interesting. Mm, possibly. Um, thank you for bringing that up. My other issue with just the planning of it, and, and we did discuss this, was that I didn't know the dates of these 
schedules and in my regular work job, I have a very, very busy week next week with some really big events literally every day. And so I will carve out time and I apologize to my staff and my own job um, for stepping away from that. But I do think it's important for me to attend as you, as you mentioned. Um, so I will be attending, but um, I will not be able to be there the entire time. And I do appreciate um, Mr. Gonzalez, the second part, and I hope that everyone understands this, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dr. McClay, but my understanding is that once staff, if this, res if this is passed, the plan is, oh, regardless, yes, we're gonna do the second part no matter what. Correct, yes. So, so the staff will then go to a second meeting with our curriculum experts and will discuss how these resolutions apply to the state standards and the curriculum and all the questions will be brought forward and where Mr. Gonzalez mentioned, <clears throat> those will be the concerns that we will look at and hopefully, possibly, if we can come to some consensus on um, amending the resolution, I mean, I'd love to delete the resolution, but at minimum to, um, to revise it I think those are the critical pieces, and that's what I, that was my intention, um, was to have those really great discussions, and I hope that we can move that forward and hear from parents and students in that same manner, so. Yeah, may I ask you a question? You referred to the state standards. Was that by any chance a reference to the state standards for ethnic studies courses? No, that was not. Okay. All right, let's listen to Mr. Schwartz. Well, no, no, I'm the odd man out here. Two people discussed. I, I don't want him on. Please shut him off. I don't, I, I don't want Mr. him. Mr. Schwartz, please be respectful of the guest speaker I am being in. respectful. I, I don't want him hearing my comments because he might be insulted. And I don't want to insult our guest. All right, we're going to temporarily actually act. You want I'd to like to go. Now? I'd like to go with Mr. Schwartz first. Yes, we, can I, mute, I, Chris, we can I, we can mute Chris Aaron, like even though speak. he'll hear the whole thing live. It's Mr. Schwartz next. Yes. Okay. So uh, as I said, I'm the odd man out here. I was not involved in either discussion, and I purposely was not involved in either discussion because of something called the Brown Act. If you guys know what that is, yeah. so I did not want to. I didn't talk to uh, Allison. I did not talk to Jen or Joe, and I did that on purpose because I have my own opinions and my own thoughts on this issue. <clears throat> so uh, first I'd like to respond to some of the things that the gentleman said. He's not an expert. He's not an expert on CRT, okay? Because he's an attorney and he studied it. Does not give him a degree in history or, eth or ethnic studies or anything that's related to critical race theory. So he may have opinions about it, but he's not an expert. Um, second, he's gonna lecture you guys. He's not gonna talk to you. He's gonna lecture you, and what is he gonna lecture you about? He's gonna lecture you about what he thinks critical race theory is. Again, he's not an expert, and he's going to lecture our teachers who have master's degrees, who have studied history, who have gone to college, who have been in the field for years and years and years, who've gone to workshops and trainings, and someone who is not an expert is going to lecture you. So now I'll read my prepared remarks, which my wife said I should read very calmly. And those of you who know my wife said I should read it calmly, right, Jen? Okay. When I first heard the proposal to have discussion groups with teachers following a presentation by an expert concerning critical race theory, I thought it might be a good idea. I expected we would bring in an expert, an educator, from a local college or university. I was surprised that instead of an academic expert, 
it is proposed to have Christopher Arendt, an attorney, and an avowed opponent of critical race theory as the expert. In an interview with the Temecula Patch, Aaron admits that he holds no academic credential concerning critical race theory, but he did serve on the Paso Robles Joint Unified School District Board, during which time a resolution was passed to ban critical race theory. It is important for parents and teachers to know that TVUSD ban on CRT was taken from the ban in Paso Robles. Aaron acknowledges that he holds no degree in the area in which he claims to be an expert. And in an interview with the Temecula Patch, he says, critical race theory is a disgustingly racist ideology. That's a quote. Those are his words. I reiterate that critical race theory is not part of state mandated curriculum. Continuing discussion is a waste of time and a distraction from our mission to educate students. Spending, I heard people mention 15,000, 30,000. I spoke to some people in the cabinet, considering the cost of substitutes that we'd have to hire, it could be as high as $50,000 to hire this gentleman to lecture our teachers. That money could be used to fund the Great Oak High School trip to the national competition. That money could be used for high school field trips or high school graduation expenses. Thank you. Mr. Aaron, can you hear me? Yes, yes. OK. So I have a couple of questions for you. Um, is it true that you served on school board for more than two years. I heard that this evening, and it was my understanding you served from 2018 to 2022. Right. It... I served from 2018 to 2022. The last two years, I served as the president of the school board here. OK. Um, th there was also something discussed tonight about suspension, fines, um, levying. Uh, that was ridiculous. Well, and, and I just uh, want you to uh, clarify that for us, because I want to be sure, sure we're sure. on the same I, page I was, with uh, that. Uh, yeah, I was uh, active as a lawyer for a long time, and then uh, I went on the inactive role uh, till about four or five years ago, something like that. And then I completely retired, which meant I stopped paying my dues to the Bar Association. That's what happens. And when you stop paying your dues, you're no longer put on inactive status, which is a cheaper uh, dues and on active status, you become then suspended. And all you have to do then, if you want to uh, reactivate yourself, you pay a little bit of money to the bar and you go back on active status, which is exactly what I've done. And I, th I thought, I, frankly, I was going to be retiring a few years ago. Uh, as it is, I've decided to go back on active status. All right. It has nothing to do with fines. The, the, the idea that I had some might have somehow engaged in misconduct and been punished by the bar is absolutely ludicrous and it's insulting. Okay. Uh, it's just, it's just false. Okay, thank you for clarifying. How would you define your expertise? Because I know that's been in question tonight. So what are three points that you would say give you that clarification and that level of expertise where you can pour into teachers? I know they don't want to be dictated to. I'd love for them and myself to hear how you and you plan to include that in a conversational piece. I'm going to use, look, I've read a lot of stuff about uh, a lot of the critical race theory writings by the leading authors and by a lot of the not so leading authors. I've just finished writing a rather lengthy manuscript, which I hope to get published about critical race theory. And this has been a subject that I've been interested in for I don't know, a very long time, and it kind of goes hand in hand with studying the law, of course. When you study the law, you study one of the main principles is equal protection under the law, and there is a, you are, of course, aware of the discussion nowadays between equality and equity, so sort of buzzwords, uh, but the equality aspect is equality uh, is, refers to equal protection under the law, and there is a clear distinction between that and the understanding of equity as it is expressed in many areas of public policy, also in areas of education. 
Mm -hmm. I do think there's a so war on words feet. today. I feel like there's a war on words, and you might agree with that as we <coughs> tend to try to change semantics and defining things. But the, the one thing I want to ask you, too, is with your school board experience, would you consider yourself an expert in ed code? Because I know that's important, and as we look at the resolution and, and want to discuss these items, is that an area you would say you're very familiar with? I have, a, I, I, I have pretty good familiarity with it, and especially with a lot of the constitutional law doctrines that play a role. For instance, uh, the First Amendment rights of students and teachers. I've uh, done a lot of work in that area, and matter of fact, uh, we had to instruct our student staff, the local community here, about uh, the First Amendment rights of teachers and students a couple of years back when uh, uh, parents started seeing some of the things that teachers had uh, on display in remote learning. You know, that's what triggered a lot of this uh, uh, discussion used to be education took place kind of quietly, and parents went to the open house and that was about it uh, at teachers conference and so on but they didn't really see what was going on in the classroom and all of a sudden they started seeing what was going on in the classroom uh, roughly three years ago and uh, the, the move has gotten a little bit heated I'm hoping that when people sit down have a discussion with civil discourse and deal with some intellectual concepts that are they're not that difficult, but you have to break them down to their individual components that people will be able to communicate a lot better than, for example, some of the stuff I've heard, uh, uh, be it in the press or elsewhere, or at some of our own school board meetings. Uh, it helps when you have an understanding of where the other side is coming from. Uh, what's the cap for each session? Is there a minimum, maximum? If you're doing six sessions, what, what's the max that you can take within each focus group? I, th I think, well, I, I left that to your uh, uh, district administration. I think they're planning roughly 30 participants per section. Uh, since we're doing it in, originally the idea had been to do it more along the lines of the Socratic method, which takes a little bit longer. It would have been more like three-hour sessions, but they decided to do two-hour sessions. And I think uh, they're working off uh, a capacity of about 30 people per session, which would include both uh, staff and uh, administrators, and I'm hoping maybe one or two uh, members of the community would be invited to participate too. Is there any way to record one of these sessions? Because I ran into a teacher the other day from a site who said there's only two teachers that can be chosen, and she was disappointed with that. Um, is there any way, and maybe this is an administrative question too, to tape one of those so that if teachers can't get away, there's a cap, but they want to view this discussion, is there a way to go through a platform where maybe your material's protected because I'm sure um, that's yeah, important well, to I you? Think, but I think that's covered, as I recall, in the draft contract. Okay, but, uh, just wanted to be sure. Uh, and the, uh, I don't have it in front of me, but the idea was you all can record it, you can distribute it to okay. make it available to all your staff and so on. Uh, basically, commercial. You can disseminate it a lot, just no commercial dissemination. If it gets, you start use, making commercial use of it, uh, then we have to have some discussion. But uh, I want this to be as you know, broadly disseminated as possible within your district so that, look, I, I, I saw the recording of your meeting on December 13th and a couple of the other meetings. Uh, it's a pity that people are more talking at each other than talking with each other, and I'm hoping that this, uh, uh, that these sessions can turn that around a bit. One last question. So for the investment, I mean, that's why I'm asking because I want as many people to be able to listen in um, if we vote this through. Um, so with the workshop that I've been working on, which is entirely separate, um, yeah. you know, we had a low budget of under $5,000. We've assembled a panel of five speakers. They're receiving $500 per person. I've tried to be sure. very cognizant of money. Um, and diversity and uh, all, all of those things. And so my question is, in your contract, it looks like there might be um, a higher fee if you were to participate uh, in that I, panel. I, 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 Are I you good with, the, like, us shaving that? I'll do the same that? thing that the others. I'll do the same thing that the others uh, okay. do. I didn't know. I haven't been involved much in that discussion either. I just knew it was uh, being planned and that uh, I was – Intended to be one of the and intended to be one of the panelists. Right, we've kept panel, it separate. Course, so uh, equal to equal treatment among the panelists. There, of course. Okay. 
Okay. All right. Thank you, Chris. I'm going to pass you to uh, Dr. K. Okay. Quick question. You mentioned Socratic dialogue, which I'm a huge fan of. Is there going to be a two-way conversations in these um, focus as, sessions? As I understand, you, you're, the schedule that was presented to me by the administration is that uh, it'll be about one hour, 20 minutes of uh, lecture. I'm hoping I can maybe squeeze it a little bit shorter than that. And then the rest of the time for discussion, Q&A, discussion. And also, I am perfectly willing to be available afterwards, late into the night, if uh, anyone wants to, uh, to talk about these issues. Okay. Say, I'd, lo I'd love the opportunity uh, to talk with uh, 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 some of the uh, some of the members, you know, from the public who spoke. I remember the uh, you have one veteran there who spoke. I'm a veteran also. Uh, and, uh, we can, uh, you know, I'd love to. Maybe he could attend one of the sessions. Of course, that would depend on your administration how you invite a select member of the public to participate in one of the things. But uh, you know, I, I think it's important because it's such an issue in your community that uh, we get some. You know, a, a broad participation. And I think then people will find this isn't really, look, banning CRT has nothing to do with whitewashing history. If someone thinks it has something to do with whitewashing history, they just show they really don't know what CRT is and what banning it is about. It's the same uh, with the other great fears there of, you know, some of the hyperbole I've heard in some of the public comment. But look, it's uh, uh, also, by the way, I've heard, you are against CRT, how can you teach about it? Well, I'll bet, my guess is you probably have some courses in your uh, social studies curriculum there about communism, because it sort of was a big thing in history, and uh, I'll bet those courses are not being taught by people who are communists. Right? It's, uh, it's possible to deal intellectually with a concept, with a doctrine, uh, without being a supporter of it. Okay, thank you, Chris Aaron, and thanks for your service. I'm gonna, um, I think we're done with the questions, but I have now a question for Mr. Gonzalez. Um, I'm just okay, gonna. So do you want me to just, should we go off the phone now? Yeah, I think, I think we're good with questions. So we'll let you go, and thank you once again. Okay, bye. Okay, bye-bye. All right, Mr. Gonzalez, I have a question. Uh, Mr. Gonzalez, I have a question for you. So there is a disruption in the teaching flow when you have to pull teachers in the focus groups and Mrs. Barclay. So what about doing it after hours? Saving, saving the district money. This is yeah. just a question. So, so is there I, a cost benefit analysis to not doing it during the school hours? Because as I believe Monday and Tuesday, don't we have six signups? So about, about probably eight weeks ago, um, I, I brought forward, you know, the idea of bringing in Chris. I had a budget of $5,000 allocated for using his services. It was going to be a lot more you know, someone like Allison and me, or you and Steve, two board members and a group of eight or 10 panelists to sit down, crack open the books and have these discussions. That has evolved from there into, you know, kind of the groups that we're looking at now that I think everybody collectively decided would be more effective use of, you know, that time and, and get the, the feedback that we needed. So that's where the budget sits at now. Um, that had input from everybody on down the line. Do you know what the final well, another, line will be? Another, another, oh, I'm sorry. So this was this is ran by the executive committee. Or, uh, so it, it, without having run the numbers, it's a little hard. But off the top of my head, we still have to pay teachers when they come to professional development after school. So oftentimes, it is far more expensive because their hourly rate. Um, a substitute for the six hour day is, so, so typically we get more bang for the buck to pull a teacher. Um, again, we're really careful or we try to be careful when we pull teachers because as you heard, we're pulling them out of the classroom. But it's not typically a way to save money to go to an after school model, but we could run the numbers. That, that helps well, actually. If you don't mind, and, and I, I think what I would add to that conversation is I, I mentioned that regardless of whether or not we approve Mr. Aaron's contract, we're still moving forward with these focus groups. So we still have the sessions with the RESS department with our curriculum experts. Those are gonna continue. So we're not trading that cost of, you know, those, those teachers being pulled out of class. We still need to get their feedback. I think it'll be more beneficial if they're able to get what I consider to be the board's perspective 
that passed this resolution banning critical race theory. I think that Mr. Aaron shares that, that viewpoint and that understanding, and I think it'll help with those conversations to understand kind of better where some of us are coming from in, in you know, um, supporting the passing of that. So. Right, and then my other point too um, is that not all people that are um, educators come to present to TBOSD. We have lawyers that present on the Brown Act, just as a point of clarity. The other thing is, not, not to the staff. Order. And another point of clarity, I've actually listened to emails, I've listened to parents, I've listened to a lot of people, um, and I've also listened to teachers, and from what I'm hearing, 165 teachers out of 180 possible slots are very interested in going to listen to Chris Aaron and these focus groups. So that's just a point of clarity. I'm actually listening to the teachers as well. That's the well, data that we have. Unless I'm mistaken, unless they're going to not listen to Chris Aaron, there's 165 teachers that signed up. Yeah. yeah. Okay, they're, going not, to, they're going to not, not listen to Chris Aaron. <laughs> not to, Order, let Mr. Dr. Klamath speak. Please not be Not to contradict you, Dr. Kamarowski, yeah, but I just, just want I want to just be sure we're all speaking factually. Many teachers who have signed up are have expressed that they are coming and are more interested in the second part. They want to roll up their sleeves. They want to dig into curriculum. They want to take that resolution line by line and ask questions like, how does this impact what I teach in my classroom? What is appropriate? What isn't appropriate? How does this affect us? So we are hearing more interest toward that, but we have specifically said to sign up, it's a two-part series, series, assuming it's approved tonight. So I just want to clarify that because I, I know there's a lot of folks out there. Thank you, and that helps okay. because I did not work on this with Mr. Gonzalez and Ms. Barclay, so I'm, I'm working my way through how this <laughs> is going to play out. So, right. Okay, and, thank you. Yeah, and, and I, I, I think Jody hit it on the head because that's, that's kind of the idea is it's being kind of packaged together with both of those discussions. Yeah. Um, I just think that if we, if we I, we've heard a lot of this one-sided kind of viewpoint. We want to we want to have an opportunity to present our perspective on the resolution. I've walked through it in detail along with, you know, I I fielded emails from Jeff Pack with with a, a full you know um, <laughs> write up on every detail. I went through it in detail. I sat down with Mr. Aaron and we walked through every line item of those comments. Like it's not like I grabbed it, threw it over the you know shoulder. I walked through it with him. I want to understand you know why these things are coming up. So. What I'm asking for is that we include Mr. Aaron's conversation so that these teachers can have that context when walking through. It, if, if I could add, um, I walked through the resolution with Professor William O'Mara, who's a professor of history. If you see what's in red, those are his comments on the resolution. The black is the resolution. Every line in the resolution is analyzed and either agreed with or rebutted. So I don't, I, I'm sorry. Um, so we're gonna get Mr. Aaron's opinion of it. I have William O'Mara's opinion of it. I have spoken with professors at MSJC, at Cal State University San Marcos, uh, people who are experts in the field and I think the second part is the vital part where teachers get to talk about how this will affect them and what they think. Um, and I would agree with keeping that part. I don't think we need to spend $15,000 on the gentleman who thinks that CRT is um, disgustingly racist ideology. And I yield back. Thank you. And thank you. Are we ready to take this to vote? Do I have a no, motion? Not yet. A no, not yet. Let's, let's wrap it up. Okay. So, so what I would like to say here is I think it's much wiser to have an anchor for discussions because we've passed the resolution. There needs to be clarification, education, and discussion where people are ready to hear but also learn and also to discuss. And I want you to know I've looked through some contracts um, and – um, Vincent Pompey, we've paid thousands of dollars for diversity, equity, inclusion. That's more his expertise. Um, there's thousands of dollars here. Um, there's a $46,000 contract for Innovate Education, $1,500 a day for perhaps 42 days with Eric Forseth. 
um, $14,250 for Emily and Stuart Consulting. So my point is, is I kind of went through our track record of what we've done for trainings, things that are important to us. They come from a variety of fields. And so this is not out of the ordinary. Uh, I think as important as this discussion is on a local, state, and national level, it is important to have somebody that comes to the table and can advocate, but also pull in people for the discussions. From that point, I would hope there would be some talk about where the resolution might need to go. With the workshop, which is entirely different, you're gonna have five different experts. They don't vote the same, they don't look the same, they don't have the same background. Can I speak? Can I finish? Can I finish? My hope is, with a part A that I haven't had anything to do with and a part B, there will be a different point in our community that will be so helpful. I think it's important to keep moving through it. So I just wanted to point out that contracts, um, we've done them in the thousands, and it's because we believe in investing in the nexus of TVUSD globally. Our teachers are our most important resources. That's how I see it. So. Um, let me I, order. I'm going to call for a vote. Wait, I call for a motion and Joe, a second to no, approve. No, Joe, I have something else to say. I'm sorry, but we can say we have we're going to. We, we do have a busy schedule, Mrs. Barclay, and I Got just it. want to remind you we have other governing items. Thank to you. To. I appreciate that. I will conclude with okay. this comment. Okay, thank you. Um, Jen, that is not apples to apples. Eric Forseth is a very well-known and highly regarded educator. All of those people have very specific areas of expertise that they've studied for many, many years. Definitely not apples to apples. And I'm just gonna say this one more time because I think we know how this vote is gonna go. This is sowing division in the community. We do not have enough support in the community for this resolution to have a civil conversation and I know that's what you want and I know that's what you want but it's not where we're at yet we're just not there and this will continue to divide us it's not even a topic that needed to be addressed at our first board meeting nor does it now it's just but we can't not change the past so correct point, we've got to so move let it lie. so we can let it lie we can let it lie and we can listen to input, which we should have done before we did the resolution. Bringing in more people to bring in one side of one opinion is not going to help. And I am just here pleading with you all because we are throwing gasoline on this fire. It breaks my heart and I feel like I'm about to come to tears right now because I hate this. I hate coming to these board meetings, it's so hard. It just makes me sick to my stomach all day because it's not what we want. We are not modeling for our kids the way we should be acting, none of us. And it is so difficult. And I know for a fact we are all standing up for what we believe to be right. We do not have bad intentions, but at this moment, we need to calm things down. We need to listen and stop talking. Thank you, Mrs. Barclay. I call for a motion and a second to approve the consultant agreement with the Aaron Law Firm for consulting services provided to Temecula Valley Unified School District effective February 13th, 2023 through June 30th, 2023. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mr. Gonzalez. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Wersema. All in favor say aye. 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 All against say nay. Nay. No. Two opposed. Motion adopted three to Three to two. <laughs> Please see yourself out if you're going to continue on with the disrespectful behavior. <laughs> Item number three, new job description, maintenance worker. Six, lead plumber, irrigation. Do I have a call, uh, a call for a motion, a second to approve the new classified job description, ma maintenance worker, six, lead plumber irrigation. Do I have a motion and a second? Moved. Moved by Mrs. Wersma. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. All in favor say aye, uh, unless there's discussion. No, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted five to zero. Number four, new job description, maintenance worker for painter. I call for a motion and a second to approve the new classified job description, maintenance worker for painter. Do I have a motion and a Moved. second? Moved by Mr. Sh Mr. Schwartz. 
Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. Do I have any discussion? Let's take it to vote then. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Number five, revised administrative job description intervention administrator TK through eight. I call for a motion and a second to approve the revised administrative job description intervention administrator TK through eight. Any uh, discussion on this? Moved. Uh, moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Number six, notice to conduct a public hearing of the California School Employees Association and its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District's joint proposal for reopener contract negotiations for the 2023-2024 school year. I call for a motion and a second. Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Mrs. Barclay. I have a question. Okay, oh, discussion, thank Mr. you. Mr. Diaz, are you okay with this? Direct the question to Mr. Arce well, first. He's, and it's, it's with the <laughs> union. Mr. Sorry. Shorts, this is reopeners with CSEA. Oh, with it's, our I'm sorry. Chapter 538 classified uh, association. Sorry, Francisco, thank you. I retract my question. And it's a joint proposal, so both uh, the district and CSEA are agreeing to reopen all the, these. All of these are joint? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. Um, all in favor? Aye. 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 Motion adopted 5 to 0. 7. Conduct a public hearing of the California School Employees Association in its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District's joint proposal for reopener contract negotiation, negotiations for the 2023 2024 school year. Move. Call for a motion and a second moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. By the second by, seconded by Mrs. Barclay. Now I have to conduct the public hearing. Oh, all in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted five to zero. <clears throat> all right, bear with me here. <clears throat> public hearing. This is the time and place designated for the public hearing to review and consider the joint proposal by the California School Employees Association and its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District for reopener contract negotiations for the 2023-2024 school year. I declare the hearing now open at 9.26 p.m. Any discussion? Is there anyone who wishes to comment on the joint proposal by the California School Employees Association and its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District for reopener contract negotiations? for the 2023-2024 school year. A total of 30 minutes is provided to members of the public can address the board. Speakers are limited to three minutes. Do we have any comments regarding that? If so, um, okay. If there are no more comments, I will declare the public hearing closed. Public hearing end time, 9.27 p.m. Eight, acceptance of the California school Employees Association and its Temecula Chapter 538 and Temecula Valley Unified School District's joint proposal for reopener contract negotiations for 2023-24 school year. I call for a motion and a second. Moved. Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Ms. Wiersma. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. Number nine. Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA, NEA, and Temecula Valley Unified School District Memorandum of Understanding, Elementary Case Management Time, February 24, 2023. I call for a motion and a second. Moved. Second. Unless there's, okay, no discussion. Moved by Mr. Short, seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0. 10, revised certif... Uh, Certificated Administrative Salary Schedule Elementary Principal. Unless there's discussion, I call for a motion and a second. Can we have a, just a quick discussion on this one? Yeah, maybe yeah, yeah. From, from... Sure, I, absolutely. Mr. Gonzalez, I can share a little bit about this. We're actually recommending uh, that the board approve an adjustment to the elementary principal salary schedule, and that, that would lead to it being more in line with the compensation for their middle school counterparts as their duties are similar and they work the same amount of days. And am I, am I to understand that the overall impact, I mean, district-wide is only about 157 total? Yes. Okay. 
I, I get it. I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm having a little struggle with it because <laughs> we struggled to find money to pay more for our, our substitute teachers and it seems like the top end is getting increases before we deal with some of the, those lower end positions. So it just, it, it seems backwards to me, but I'm not necessarily opposed to it. I just wanted to have some understanding and discussion about that. Is this something that you work with TVEA on, or is that something that's no, internal? This is something that's internal. We, we realized after uh, doing some analysis on the fact that elementary principals uh, currently with our salary schedules get paid in essence less than middle school principals and they work the same amount of days. Duties are the same in terms of making sure that they're responsible for student safety, for discipline, meetings with parents, all of the things that, you know, uh, training of staff, all of the things that principals are responsible for. It's just uh, that was historically our practice of having that salary schedule. But when we looked at it and felt well, they work the same amount of days, have the same amount of duties. We thought it would be prudent to make this recommendation to the board. And just to add, um, you'll notice there's a lot of agenda items regarding compensation or staffing. This year, for uh, the second time ever, the school districts in the state of California received an augmentation to the COLA. So we received six point some percent in COLA. And in addition to that, we received another like 6.2% in augmentation. And the idea behind that was is uh, California was like 47 out of 50 in funding of uh, school districts. And so what we've done this entire year is we've been looking at salary schedules and we've been looking at staffing to evaluate a new baseline to build upon. And we've never, we haven't historically had the funds to do that. So making things more equitable. So you saw the, you see the SLP salary schedules on the agenda tonight. That's an, an effort to do that. This revision to the prim elementary principals, that's an, an effort to do that. The, the counselor, the CTE, all of these are coming all at once, adding the painter, uh, and thank you for approving that. These are things that we've wanted to do historically and just never had the funds to do, so it's not coincidental that it's this year and right now. We are set up, settled for compensation across the board, but from time to time we will bring individual salary schedules to fix what we perceive to be not competitive or not equitable salary schedules, if that makes sense. Absolutely, and I, I would assume that, that, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to no, cut no, you off again. We, we did obviously run comparisons similar to what we did when evaluating the sub-schedules, and this was- Yes, that is this correct. Was the determination. Okay, thank you. And it is very exciting to see those. I know there are probably former board members at home cheering right now to see those SLPs and CTE salaries yeah, sure. at the place where where we had hoped them to be from long before my time, so. Yeah, many of these things have been a long time coming. Um, one other question, when would be the appropriate time to talk about things like taking our campus security folks who are at three and a half hours and possibly extending that or making any of those more full time? I've heard a lot of talk in that arena and I'd be fascinated to know if any of that can come to fruition because of what they're giving, yeah. their gifts, their, um, you know, I know benefits and all those things roll into it and make it a larger conversation, but what would you yeah. suggest? Would so it be? We want to uh, be real careful because it's not agendized tonight. Oh, but just, sorry. no, no, that's okay. Just so you know, all of these discussions are already happening with every department and every site. Um, that's all part of what Mrs. Lash's department does during the spring. They start in January and go all the way through March. In May, we bring staffing recommendations and changes to the board in one big report to ask for things just like that. Perfect, so. thank you. Thank you, Dr. McLean. Any other? Okay, where was, oh, yes. M moved by Mr. Schwartz, I called for it, and we got, yeah. Moved by Mr. Schwartz, do I have a second? Second. Seconded by Mr. Gonzalez, all in favor, aye. say aye. 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 Motion adopted, five to zero, and we're off to 11. Temecula Valley Educators Association CTA, NEA, and Temecula Valley Unified School District Memorandum of Understanding Speech and Language Pathologist Salary Schedule. Call Move. for a motion and second on this, unless there's discussion. Yeah, I just want to say we've been talking about this for ages, and I'm glad to see that we finally uh, got it done. Uh, we talked about it, the old board talked about it, and uh, these people who are superior workers and dedicated workers, 
deserve to uh, be paid uh, a competitive salary. So I'm glad we're doing it. I agree, and I know a speech pathologist in uh, Temecula is very happy about this. My sister is also one, but she's not here. But you know, she'll be happy for the speech pathologists all around. Yeah. yeah. Regardless, I'm I'm glad to see it happening. So I, I'm happy to second. Okay, good. Uh, oh, it was moved by Mr. Schwartz, seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5 0. 12, Temecula Valley Educators Association, CTA, NEA, and Temecula Valley Unified School District Memorandum of Understanding Career Technical Education CTE Salary Schedule. Do moved. I have a motion? Uh, yeah. Second. Moved by Mr. Schwartz, seconded I, by I Mr. Barclay. I was going to say, do I have a motion and a second? I, I, I'd also like to comment this I'm is... I'm sitting in Sandy's seat. I'm supposed oh, you to are in Sandy's seat. I was going to say, this is with Sandy Hinkson's uh, <laughs> pet peeve for, for meeting yeah, after yeah. meeting after meeting. Yeah, this is uh, another And victory. those of us uh, I know who've been to uh, um, see some of our CTE programs know the quality of the people we have, and they deserve to be paid um, a commensurate salary with their skills, so I'm glad to see we're doing this. Yeah, me too. And I've only seen a few, and I'm blown away. The kitchen at Temeca Valley High School. I mean, are you are you kidding me? You see what they serve. Oh, oh I can't wait. Okay. Um, all in favor? I, we had aye. a motion a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 A motion adopted five zero. We're off to thirteen staffing changes, increase in certif certificated uh, certificated counselors and TK eight intervention administrators. Do I have any discussion on this? About time. About time. Um, do I have a? Oh. I, I do have a question on this, just for clarification. Um, I was reading about this online. It says, from this, we propose increasing our counseling staff at the high school level by 4.8 FTE. Uh, and then it gives the stats for the different schools and one intervention administrator at each of the middle schools, which is great. Um, my question is, what about elementary? Because this is TK been. through eight. Um, I just wanted to clarify with the mention there of TK through eight. Does yeah. So the the revision to the job description, uh, we currently have elementary intervention administrators. Mm -hmm. So the revised job description then allows us to also um, have middle school intervention administrators under that same job description. And just to piggyback on that. Um, where we were hearing the most need is at the caseload numbers at the secondary level, um, being well over you know 400 and some students per counselor, and that's what we were trying to address was the secondary caseload specifically because um, not only the social emotional needs that have increased since post pandemic, but truly that college and career readiness piece that you really only see at the high school level. Thank you, and I forgot we had a public comment from Tina May, who I met at the uh, Student of the Month Award. Uh, please come up, Tina, floor is yours for three minutes. <laughs> Take your time. Is that better? Awesome. It's actually to say thank you because I was here, I've, I've been in education for 28 years and I had never done um, a public comment ever until nine months ago. And so some of you heard it. It's not easy for counselors to ask for help. And so when I did, I had a really hard time getting through my speech without crying. And so to see this on the agenda, I have to thank you. Uh, Nicole, I still love my job. She hired me over at SHAP. Um, and I told her that as many times as I could. And I asked a lot of questions because I really wanted to understand how staffing decisions were made for counselors. I'm sorry I asked so many questions, but you were patient and you were very thorough in your answers. So I want to thank you guys. And you have to know that this is really going to help ease some of the stress off of the counselors at the secondary level and to take um, the administrative stuff off of the middle school is huge also so that they can actually 
give 100% to their counseling duties now. So as you guys go ahead and vote, I just wanted you guys to know, thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Call for a motion and a second. Moved. Moved. Uh, simultaneous move uh, by Mr. Gonzalez. And then do I have a second by Ms. Wersma? Looks second. like it worked out. Uh, unless it was Ms. Barclay. I, no. Okay. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5 0. Um, transportation plan number 14. Um, unless we have discussion, I call for a motion and a second to approve the transportation plan for the 2022-23 and 2023-24 school years. Do I have a motion and a Moved. second? Moved by Mr. Schwartz. Second. Seconded by Mr. Gonzalez. All in favor say aye. 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 Motion adopted 5-0 and we have pushed off the governing handbooks for a tentative workshop in May that we're gonna wait for Lene. And now we are in negotiations update. Do we have any? Sure, I'll be very brief okay. for the Thank community, you, Dr. Komorowski. Uh, I'll start with TVA. We met with TVA on March 10th, 2023 to have some further discussion regarding leadership stipends at the elementary, middle school, and high school levels. We continue conversations about that topic and we'll meet with a subcommittee for alternative settings regarding leadership stipends on the 23rd. And then we have a session for full negotiations planned on the 17th. With CSCA, uh, we, had, we have three negotiation sessions scheduled for March 22nd, April 13th, and April 28th. And that's it for my negotiations update. Thank you, Dr. Komorowski. Thank you, Mr. Arce. And uh, any discussion on that or comments, Mr. Arce? Okay, now we are on board comments and we can start down on the far left with Mr. Gonzalez, if you have any. Uh, yeah, I actually have quite a few. I've, I've had a busy, couple of weeks so I just wanted to kind of share some of the stuff that I've been doing and talk about um, some of the reasons why I joined this <laughs> asked for this position not the not the fun stuff um, after the uh, the last board meeting um, the the first thing that I was able to attend was uh, the workability uh, community and student recognition portion and um, this was absolutely moving to see firsthand um, I had no idea that this program was even a part of our district um, uh, Breck Hilton and her staff um, are really raising the bar and I really appreciate all the hard work that they're doing. I was actually moved um, to tears by one of the, the, the speakers, um, a, a student named Julian who is um, kind of phasing out of the program. This is his last year there. Um, and he put together, wrote and, direct, and delivered one of the best public speeches I've ever heard anywhere. And as somebody who has to do public speaking from time to time. I know how difficult it can be. And um, I know we're gonna see great things from him. If you don't know about the WorkAbility program at all, um, I would encourage you to reach out to me, reach out to our district. Um, they did express an interest to have um, additional trade partners um, to give these students more opportunities to learn these, these job and life skills. Um, I am gonna be working just independently, I'm going to some of the local BNI groups and some of the business organizations. Um, leveraging some of the relationships that I have with local businesses um, to see if I can help them to, to just um, get more opportunities for these, these awesome students. So um, uh, I did a, uh, a site visit. I went to uh, our, our home school, Nicholas Valley Elementary, um, toured the campus with, uh, with Ms. Harmon and, and uh, Ms. Dr. McClay. Um, Again, I just, I continue to be astonished by the high level of education that our kids receive there um, on site. Um, I have been um, the, the, the beneficiary of uh, a lot of great teachers there at, um, at Nicholas Valley, as well as the, uh, um, the social workers and the, 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 um, the, the entire staff there. Um, we uh, were lucky to, <laughs> to call that our, our kind of home school. So, um, we, we did see a number of kind of, um, let's just call them facility issues while we were visiting there on site. Um, I did take notice of some of those things. Um, I know that it's gonna go into the plan later on down the line, but I was paying attention. I did hear about those um, and what we're gonna call Lake Nicholas from now on, which is underneath the swing set over there that needs to get fixed immediately, please. Um, 
uh, outside of that, um, I, I also returned the, the next week. I, I just got to volunteer as a dad for the Day of Awesomeness, which was really cool to, to interact with all of the students. And then um, finally, I was able to attend my first uh, athletic advisory committee. I saw some familiar faces today um, when we were doing recognitions with the wrestling teams. Um, Dr. Komorowski and I actually both attended that. Um, I would not want to be a master scheduler after um, the, the, the time change. Um, I got a kind of a first-hand look at all of the challenges associated with uh, scheduling and, and what these, these folks have to deal with. And I have to say that, that um, Ms. Ricken over at Great Oak really stood out as a problem solver, and I just want to commend her. Um, I didn't get a chance to, to speak with her directly, but um, it really came through, and her being part of that group and sharing some of her solutions um, are amazing. She's a, she's a rock star, and I just wanted to acknowledge that I, I saw that, and thanks for listening. Thanks, Danny. Thank you. Well, um, I have really appreciated getting to talk and email with lots of people in the community, and I really do love to um, to hear from people. It's actually like my favorite part of being on the board is dialoguing with the community. Um, I never. I never knew that was missing in my life, but I really do enjoy that and hearing from people. Um, I was able to attend um, the Ready Commission meeting, which is with the city and um, with with my friend down there. We've gone twice now. Um, the city did um, vote to move those um, month proclamations out of their council. And so um, in support of that, I've been attending the Ready Commission meetings. And last month was um, the Black History Month recognition, which was amazing. Our students were fantastic that, rep that represented the district there. I was, I'm just continually impressed. I definitely could not have done that as a high school student, and they were phenomenal. And once again, this month for Women's History Month, it was amazing. Their presentations were so great. They did videos, and they were just so well-spoken. And I'm just so proud, um, proud of our students. Um, I was really impressed with, I love seeing these ASB students here every time and shout out to my daughter who was in the election at TV and she did win a seat on the exec board for All next right. year. So I'm really proud of her. Um, and, um, it's impressive to hear all of the wonderful things that, that are going, that's going on. And that's just the highlight of the meeting for me. And also just to, you know, give one more plug for stunt. I know that some people are at the stunt game tonight. Shap has a game. Uh, Thursday, Great Oak versus TV over Ooh. at Great Oak. So okay. you will see me there okay. if you can make it. Um, and Temecula Valley had their, uh, they were in a tournament this weekend and they were the champions of their tournament. And let me just tell you, those girls were phenomenal. So they're ones to watch. So I'd encourage you guys to check out that new um, newer Title IX sport that that this district has been so amazing in promoting. Um, and I do know um, we do have an event coming next week on next Wednesday night. Um, a lot of people have talked to me about that. I think I have expressed my views about that. Um, and I do think it's important for um, for us to hear that in order to have opinions on what is said. So I would encourage people to go to hear uh, what is said that night. That's it. Thanks. <clears throat> it was a very busy month for me. Um, I visited six schools, and I continue to be amazed at all the wonderful programs and learning that go on. Thanks to all the staff for the success. Um, the principals of each of those schools, I'm going to mention their names because I don't think people talk about them enough. Uh, Red Hawk Principal Cheryl Takua, Tony Tobin Principal Manuel Granuel, Alamos Principal Jennifer Ainsworth, Fount, uh, French Valley Principal Jonathan Cole, Nicholas Valley Principal Chrissy Harmon, and Crown Hill Principal Dustin Hackney. Every one of those schools is one I would be proud to send my children to and to work in. And that's the best comment I can give about any school. I also attended the Superintendent Student Council uh, with representatives from middle schools and high schools. We did an exercise with them about what they like about their schools and what needs to be uh, improved about their schools. The children were amazing. They are so insightful as to what goes on, not only what the issues are, but how they should be dealt with. 
just, just wonderful. I also worked with uh, Dr. Anthony Price on a Jewish Heritage Month celebration. I shared my Read Across America video with seven elementary schools. And in the, as soon as uh, spring break is over, I am planning to work with the Garden Club at Red Hawk, with the librarian, Liz Terry, and at French Valley with uh, kindergarten teacher, Andrea Johnson. I promised them I'd come back and help the kids to plant their gardens, and I certainly will do that. It was a great week. Thank you. I love hearing about all of these activities and what the board is, is doing. It's truly been a joy to be very busy in the last couple of weeks. And I want to give a shout out to Mr. Evans tonight for setting the evening with music and pictures of what goes on throughout the district. Um, I had thought of that. He said that was his idea a year ago, and that's where collaboration comes in, and it's unifying for us because we all have those things that we're seeing and doing and developing, and it's just a joy. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. You do so much in the district. Um, uh, I got to meet Mrs. Nielsen at Livornia Elementary, amazing principal. Um, we all toured that day. It was hat day. I had my hat. It was so much fun to be in and out of those classrooms, shake the teacher's hands. Mr. Cole at French Valley Elementary just the other day, loved seeing his kingdom and just seeing everything from Connect Four to the Legos, the math manipulatives, the, just the fitness out on uh, the blacktop was fun to see. Presidents, the crafts hanging from the ceiling. I'm just so impressed with these elementary schools and I love meeting the teachers and um, just seeing them do what they do. As far as the cheerleading, yes, it was so much fun to go to that stunt event at SHAP. I cheered at SDSU many moons ago, and so I'm a cheerleader at heart, and to see these girls, how hard they work, how they perform, I was so, so impressed. So they powered through their jumps and tumbling, the pyramids. Um, thank you for the heads up on this week with what else is coming. You should really go watch them. Um, speaking of cheering, I also attended the Vail Ranch Middle School TYBL MSB orientation for student athletes and parents. And that was great to see both the men and women there getting their inspiration and encouragement from the coaches. It was awesome. And Mr. Kim organized that, invited me. I was so grateful to be there, just to cheer everybody on. So I love seeing that connection between the city and the district. I think that's so valuable. Um, I also got to fly into the hornet's nest to celebrate Dr. Seuss at the family engagement evening hosted by the Homestead Innovation Academy. And I have to say that was a gem that I really didn't know enough about. And I was so impressed with Principal Sandy McKay, Jennifer, Bridget, Michelle. I got to tour those facilities, look at the Dr. Seuss event, the kids in action. We have so many things in this district for everyone. I loved the variety and just them, um, having the kids go through event after event that night and just seeing the joy. Oh, and shout out to the Chaparral Improv team. Um, going back to the performing arts, those kids came in and entertained the littles. And that's how it should work in a district. It was sweet to see them get up there and perform and watch the parents and the elementary students just enjoy. So to me, that was awesome to see. Well done to Chaparral for doing that. Um, other, I'm excited about the Summit Academy. I know they've had orientations. I'm planning to go to one of the last ones and just encourage the families and be a part of that excitement. Um, just a little information about the March 22nd event, the workshop. Um, Dr. Kay and I have worked on that with a very tight budget because we're cognizant of that. Um, just to let you know, and I'm sure perhaps you've seen it online, but we have Dr. Wenyan Wu, who is a PhD, the executive director of the California Californians for Equal Rights Foundation, author, public speaker. Uh, we have Esther Valdez Clayton, who's a principal attorney at Valdez and Associates. She's an immigration attorney. She's a former school board president, eight years in Coronado. She's on national media all the time. Um, Chris Aaron that we met tonight. We have Walter Myers, who's an adjunct faculty member for Biola University, Master of Arts in Science and Religion. We have Dr. Joseph Nalvin, a PhD from the University of California, San Diego, cultural amp cultural anthropology, peace and justice, indigenous religions. He's a writer, he's an arbitrator, he's Jewish. Um, these are not cookie cutter people that vote the same way, that um, see everything the same. And I welcome what they're gonna bring. We have Dr. Brandy 
Ooh, her last name, Shafutinsky. She is also um, a director of education and community engagement, the Jewish Institute for Liberal Values, social worker, writer. Um, so I just think this is going to be a great time, not only for them to present, but also to field questions. And we're going to make that a priority. So people will be able to write those down, have their questions answered. And these people have graciously said, we want to be available for people. And I think through their humility and their hearts, you're going to see a different messaging come out of there that makes good impact. So um, again, that's on the 22nd from 6 to 9. It's for all stakeholders, and we hope that you'll take advantage of the invaluable opportunity. Um, that is it. I, I mentioned the drum line, the fact that we can all contribute to that. Uh, thank you to all of those that have hosted me. I look forward to the multicultural event at Bella Vista this week and continuing to be a part on the campuses as much as I can. Okay, thank you. Um, I'll tag on to the end. Um, I have a decent amount as well. Um, is regarding the workshop that me and Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Wersma um, have worked on, just want to let Mr. Schwartz know, unbeknownst to you, Mr. Schwartz, I know that the one of your constituents emailed you with the name Dr. Von Lawson. I did try to get a hold of that person. I spent like two hours Did trying you to. Image go through? You I know. Call. No, no. Check this out. So I, I, I. Um, you try to go on there, I can't find his contact, it's hidden, then you gotta download an app. So I'm like, all right, let me call the department, couldn't get a hold of I, I did, but it doesn't give you the full phone number and email. But it's it's all right, I'm just letting you know. I tried to reach out. I tried to um, do some background research on him. So we interviewed eight candidates to speak out of the six, two didn't get chosen, he was one. I, I just, I wanted to hear um, his point of view, so I tried. Um, Special Olympics. Uh, I forgot on the last board meeting to bring this up. When I went to the Special Olympics in Marietta, it might have been three weeks ago, my mind was blown. United Sports. Yeah, uh, what is it called? United, United Sports. United Sports, yeah. Uh, my mind was blown. I totally cried because these kids are precious. Um, loved it. Um, uh, watching bocce ball and some of the other events and one-on-one -on -one peer interaction. And I know that Mrs. Barclay's daughter was there. It was cool to meet her. She was a part of the stunt group. And I'm like, well, what's that mean? And so finally tonight, uh, Mrs. Barclay showed me a video. And I'm like, oh. And I'm like, me and my daughter used to watch movies about this. And now I know what it is. I, I didn't know until I saw the video. So if I'm off Thursday, I would like to go to Great Oak and watch competitions. I think it's really cool. And I think these um, students are crazy, throwing each other in the air. But you know, it's it, I love. Um, I'm intrigued, um, so I'd like to see that. Um, Student of the Month Award um, that I went to this last week with uh, Dr. McClay, that was another mind blower. Not just all, uh, not just the schools at uh, the, um, the three high schools, Rancho Vista I don't believe was there that day, but we had um, Linfield, Rancho Christian, and um, the Temecula Valley Prep. Um, seeing these students and hearing their stories and their parents, uh, Awesome. Um, one of my favorites was the goalie from Temecula Valley High School. She was uh, really awesome, and I love soccer, so I'm very I'm looking forward to watching soccer games with Mr. Schwartz at these schools. Um, we have a very common um, uh, entertainment value there, and Sandy, who runs the Student of the Month Awards, was just a gem. And city officials were there, so I'm looking forward to go as many times as I can. Yeah. Um, my goal is to plan on, I've, I've visited all the schools in my trustee area and I want to visit them again, but my new goal now is to visit all, I think it's 28 schools because of Summit, is that the 28th? Yes. I'm like, yeah. yes. it, it is the 28th because Summit's coming or, yeah. I, I wanna visit all the schools in the um, district. Um, I know there's gems at each school, teachers, staff, students, um, and I just want the schools to show themselves off and I, I, love, I love going there, so. That's all my plan. Um, um, as I have a, um, a decent amount of time, so I'd like to just, yeah, like to see those campuses. Um, and especially the CTE programs, I've only saw a couple, and I wanna see all of them. I'm just, like I said, I'm blown away. Um, the uh, last thing which is indirectly related to teaching is, and I'll relate this to this um, district as well, um, as, as far as me, I'm an educator. I got tenured last night or uh, last week at uh, my board of trustees at the college brought me into a tenured ceremony and it was really awesome. 
And what I did is I spoke to them and I said that, you know, through the, the, through the years of hardship, because I didn't have it easy when I was in school, I had my car broken into, I lived room to room with I don't know how many people struggling, waiting tables, you know, broke, had to take semesters off. And I told them I never, because um, I, I went to Mount Sac when I got out of the military and then long story short, I adjuncted there, now I'm tenured there. I'm jealous at all the students that have been raised at TVUSD their whole life. I didn't have that. I've, I've moved all around. I don't have a hometown. So I, I only wish I had that experience here, but I have a little bit of it at Mount Sac since I started there as a student and then went to Loma Linda and these other schools and came back. And so the one thing I imparted to the Board of tr um, Trustees there is said, you know, there was a few professors that spoke words of life into me when I was struggling as a student. I might not have even believed in myself because I didn't know what the heck I wanted to do. I'm like, do I do nuclear medicine? Do I do psychology? You know, I, you know, I, I had a bunch of options and they spoke words of encouragement and life to me and it's, um, it's one thing that kept me going in, in uh, the years of hardship because I always thought about those, those teachers cared. And so I would encourage the teachers at Temecula Valley, of course you're doing that, but if you haven't done that, the students are listening. When you speak like that, they remember it for years to come and they circle back and then all of a sudden, Dea has hired one of them. She's speaking here tonight, things like that. They remember. And so the last quote that I'll leave us with, if you haven't heard it, and I forget who said this, uh, people don't care what you know until they know you really care. And people that, when you, when you know somebody care, cares about you, it, 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 um, it fosters, um, confidence and it's infectious so that's my parting wisdom as far as that with TVOSD is you know these teachers you know or these students are listening but and I'm excited for our district in that sense um, I know that's a lot but thank you for listening I'll go quickly I'm really tired right. <laughs> it's been a long day right uh, but no awesome work tonight uh, I was especially excited to see the annual VAPA presentation because I know how hard we've worked in our district the last 15 years or so I was directly involved with the creation of our very first visual and performing arts plan and then of course with designing the elementary program which now is just incredibly robust and and you know, it hasn't arrived, we still wanna do more, but awesome, awesome work exposing all of our students all the way down to kindergarten to the visual and performing arts. Uh, so that was exciting, and then you got to meet our uh, visual and performing arts teacher on special assignment. Uh, that was a long time coming too. That was put in the original plan, I think back in 2008, so it took a long time to get there. Um, and then hearing that we're getting some additional funding uh, that could be um, utilized for visual performing arts is again really exciting. And I'll piggyback a little bit on what you said, Dr. Kamrowski, just real briefly, you mentioned how much teachers care. And I think that that is a pattern that you hear in this district, you heard it at the podium time and time and time again, that folks move here for our schools, for our amazing teachers. Teachers stay here once they're here um, because they love the colleagues that they work with, they love the support that they get. And you hear it from our students, uh, that they come back and they wanna work for us again because they had such amazing experiences. And so we had some um, dialogue tonight that was disheartening for all of us, uh, we always get, uh, particularly sad when our community is divided on topics or when our staff is divided on topics, but going back to how much our teachers care, I am absolutely 100% confident that our teachers who come next Monday and Tuesday will come with the utmost of professionalism as they always do. They will come with a positive attitude, ready to roll up their sleeves and give you the feedback that you're asking for. And so we are tasked with making that happen and we will do so, but I just once again, am, regardless of where people are at on the spectrum, I'm proud of our staff and I know that they will bring that with them on Monday and Tuesday of next week and and we look forward to giving you their input thank you dr. McClay um, we have s future agenda items staff will present information on the following agenda items for the next regular board meeting on April 11th um, for, so to forecast uh, 2023 curriculum review and LCAP action and services and Announcement of the next meeting. The next regular open session business meeting of the Governing Board of Education is scheduled for April 11th, 2023. Adjournment, the meeting is adjourned Tuesday, March 14th, 2023 at 10.03 p.m. Good night.